Good evening all and welcome. Before the video begins, I have a quick announcement. To anyone who signs up to my $10 tier on Patreon is going to get all these gifts sent to them in the mail. All these stickers, including your favorite cryptids, Deban, Bigfoot, Skinwalker, Black Eyed Kid, and the whole cryptid crew right there. Mortis Media stickers and a Let the Darkness Take Control one. Two for good measure, a bunch of them, not just once, as well as a special message from me on a postcard that I probably made myself straight to you. Something fun to keep. Also, a bunch of extra stuff is on Patreon, like an 18-minute narration I just made on there quite recently, and loads of other bonus content that you'll probably enjoy. If this is something that you like, feel free to check it out. Link in the top of the description, and if not, that's cool too. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. For context, this happened when I was 22 years old and a senior in college. I'm a female, and I was following a particular politician and was going to rallies and other events in my spare time. Me and my friends were having a ball and loved being involved. One particular rally I went to was in the city. My friends and I took a train in and enjoyed ourselves. On our way home back to our university, I noticed a guy sitting across from us that I had recognized from campus. He was pretty cute, and I remember seeing him around, as we must have had some mutual friends. I said hi to him, and to my delight he also recognized me. We spoke for a few minutes and discovered we were both at the same rally. By the end of the train ride, he asked me for my phone number, and I was thinking, wow, a cute guy and we have something in common. I gave him my number but didn't think much past that. About a week later, I received a text from him. He asked me if I'm free this weekend, and if I would be interested in meeting up and having a drink. This particular time was during a break from school, so not many people were around. For whatever reason, I had chose not to go home. In my naive mind at the time, I thought, great, I have the place all to myself. I met him at our local bar, and we have a few drinks. It was pretty quiet for a Friday, as it was break time, and after an hour or two, decided to leave. I invited him back to my place for a bottle of wine and to hang out some more. He wound up staying the night and leaving in the morning, but when I woke up for whatever reason, I had an uneasy feeling. Nothing bad had happened, per se, I just didn't like how things had went. I felt like he was so serious, not laughing or smiling the entire evening. Although he always had a drink in his hand, I realized he wasn't really drinking them. The entire evening, he was kind of shifty and nervous. The only way I can describe it, it was like he was on a mission and waiting for something. There were all these red flags to me. I felt bad, but I was just not interested in this guy. To my relief, he didn't text me for a good while after that, and I assumed he came to the same realization that we simply weren't a good match. That is until about two to three weeks later. He writes me a message telling me that he's been busy, but really wants to meet this weekend and catch up. This particular weekend, my older sister was having a large party for her husband's birthday at their house a few towns away. A few of my friends and I were going to be there as always because it's a very large group of people at their parties, at least 50 to 60. Now, let me be clear. These parties were not your typical get wasted and stay up till the cops get called type of college parties. They were more of an adult party, given my sister's husband is fairly older than us. Don't get me wrong, there were plenty of drinks and drinking going on and it was quite fun. Just more of an adult type barbecue with day drinking. Me and my two girlfriends were going to spend the night as I was going to drive there, but obviously we would be drinking. The party started early, at about noon. Against my better judgment, I invited him to the party, thinking it couldn't hurt. I gave him the address and the time. He seemed very interested and agreed to come. The day of the party was very fun, and my friends and I were having a blast. I must admit I did have a sinking feeling, and I was not looking forward to seeing the guy. Then, to my absolute and utter relief, I get a text from him saying he would be unable to make it. Finally, I could just relax and enjoy the party. About 
12 a.m. Everyone is getting exhausted from a full 12 hours of non-stop drink and party. And as it's winding down, most of the guests have gone home, except for my friends and I and a few other guys, friends of my sister's husband, who were also sleeping there. And of course, my sister and her husband. My sister had a guest room which was occupied, and a fully carpeted and finished basement. We had various blankets and pillows, and we're all going to sleep down there on the couch, pretty much anywhere you could lay. As I'm about to go down to the basement and get ready for sleeping, the man walks through the front door. No knock, no text, no anything. Just confidently walks straight into the house. I don't know why, but my initial reaction was fear. I pretended to be happy to see him and gave him a small hug. I asked him why he was there, to which he never gave a real response. All of the lights were out and everyone was gone. I was gesturing around and hinting at him that the party was over and that he had missed it. I felt bad that he had made the effort and decided to speak with him for a few minutes before I went to bed. We talked. I told him I was going to get ready for bed and that I'm sorry he missed the party. He goes, yeah, that's fine. This dude is just not getting the hint to leave. I leave the room and go to change my clothes and set myself up a bed and brush my teeth. I'm just hoping that he will leave, but I don't hear any movement from the other room. When I come back to the living room to check and see if he's actually still there, he is, and he is asleep on the couch. I obviously find this strange, but just assumed it was late and that he must have been very tired. He didn't seem out of place as there were various other people sleeping at the house as well. I went to the basement and found myself a place to sleep on the floor. About half an hour to an hour later, I'm laying on the floor, still awake, thinking about how weird it is that he showed up. It's pitch black down there. There are a few people sleeping, including my friends, when I hear someone in the dark slowly descending the stairs. I see they're holding a cell phone light to guide them. As the figure reached the bottom of the steps, I see it's him. Now, he has never been to this house. This is in a nice suburban area, it's not a frat house. And I did immediately think it was weird that he would randomly be walking through a house of a person he doesn't know. I, for one, pretended to be asleep. As I lay there frozen, I suddenly felt a tap on my shoulder. He doesn't say a word. He is over me and trying to wake me. I don't move and pretend to sleep still. I lay there in the dark silence and am listening for his footsteps to walk away. I can tell he's holding a light over me. Then, with no warning, this man takes a step back and with his boot on, kicks me full force in the face. I'm not talking about a little tap with his foot to wake me. No, full force boot kicks me directly in the face. My face goes numb. I don't know what happened. I can feel the blood running down my nose. I open my eyes and look at him and all I can remember saying is, why did you do that? He just stared at me blankly and said nothing, turned around and walked back up the steps. I lay there paralyzed in fear. My heart is beating a million times a minute. I don't know how long it was until I garnished the courage to get up, but eventually I army crawl in the dark over to my friend. Another man near her wakes up as well and I explain what happened. We are all in a half drunk daze and confused. I can't stay in this basement. I know he left, but I was so scared. My friends and the other guy offered to take me upstairs so that I could sleep in my sister's room. I go to my sister's room and lay next to her on the bed on the floor. I shut the door behind me, but unfortunately there was no lock. I don't know how, but eventually I fell asleep. At some point I wake up to my sister leaning over me. She asked what happened to my face and why I was in her room. Right as I'm about to answer her, my friend, who had helped me the night before, comes flying in and she tells us the guy is still there and asleep on the couch. She runs out and I can hear her scream at him to get up and get out. I hear him arguing back and ask him where I am. My friend tells him that I've left and he begins arguing. He says my car is still there. I have no idea how he knew which car was mine, as he had never seen it before, and that I hadn't even taken my purse. Eventually, he leaves. 
After that night, he wrote me a message a few days later, as if nothing had happened, asking me to hang out again. I block him, and I've never heard from him again after that. I graduated only two months later, and thankfully never even saw him on the campus again. To this day, I have no idea why he kicked me in the face, and how he had the balls to stay after that. I have learnt my lesson about giving out my phone number to creeps. This happened in the year of 1989, when I was nine years old. I lived in a middle-class neighborhood in Forest, Virginia. It was like a Mayberry-like neighborhood. Most everyone knew each other, no crime, lots of families. Not everyone locked their doors at night. There were lots of kids my age in the neighborhood, but the two on my street were my closest friends, Mitchell and Chase. The three of us were sort of a clique. Whenever a new kid moved into the neighborhood, we'd like to go see him together to see what he was like and decide if he was cool or not. That year, their new family moved into a house near the end of the street. They had just one child, a boy named Parker. We invited him out a few times to play and he seemed cool. So before long, he was almost one of the gang. Parker's mum was attractive, blonde, slim, always smiling. However, his dad was not a friendly man. He seemed annoyed by us kids, rarely spoke to us and mostly just acknowledged us with eye rolls and grunts. He also didn't come outside much. He worked nights, so we didn't see him often during the week and on weekends, he was mostly banging around in his garage. One Saturday afternoon in the fall, Mitch and Chase were both away for some reason, so I went over to Parker's house alone to see if he wanted to play. He said his parents weren't home and invited me inside. That was a really strange experience for me. At nine, my parents never left me alone. They would call a babysitter over if they were going to be gone for even an hour. I asked Parker why he was home alone and made no secret that I was weirded out about it, but he seemed totally fine with it, like it happened all the time. So that put me at ease. We watched TV for a little bit, then abruptly Parker got off the couch and said, hey, you wanna see something cool? Sure, I said. He led me down to the basement and pointed to a tool chest against the wall. They're in here. Parker opened the bottom cupboard drawer of the tool chest, revealing a huge stack of Playboys. There had to have been at least 50 to 60 issues in there. I had no idea what I was looking at. I'd never seen a naked woman before. The closest I had come was seeing the scantily clad Tanya Roberts in the movie The Beastmasters. I remember watching that movie and being vaguely intrigued by the female form. But what I saw in the Playboys was sort of repulsive. It wasn't necessarily the images of the naked women that churned my stomach, but the dank and musty smell of the basement, the dim lights, the crinkled, stiff, flaky feel of the magazine pages, as if the moisture of the basement was slowly turning them to pulp. It just felt wrong and gross, and I wanted to leave. Still, I just couldn't stop looking. I'd flip through one magazine, toss it back, then flip through another one. Somehow I had this strange notion that I was finally getting something valuable for free. So I needed to cram as much of it into my brain as I could. Finally, Parker said, we better get out of here. My mom will be home soon. You can tear some pictures out and take them home if you want. I ripped out one of the centerfolds and stuffed it into my pocket. I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't want it for any self-gratification purpose. I just had an idea that I could use it to impress Michael and Chase later. When I got home, I stuffed the balled up centerfold in the back corner of my closet under some toys. Despite not having a deep understanding of what it was, pornography, I was certain that if my mum found it, I'd be in big trouble. I went to sleep like normal that evening, but awoke abruptly in the middle of the night to a rough hand shaking my shoulder. I immediately knew something was wrong, 
because neither of my parents would have woken me up so firmly. Plus, there was a terrible smell, a rank combination of alcohol and motor oil. I opened my eyes, and with the aid of my bedside light, recognized Parker's dad standing over me, in my house, in my room. I wanted to cry, to scream for my dad, but the man glared down at me with so much hatred, so much fury, I was paralyzed. I was certain that if I did cry out, he would twist the head clean off my neck. You stole from me. He said this in a low voice, low enough not to wake my parents in the other room. But in the quiet of my room, the words rang clear as a bell. He called me the F word. That's what really struck me. No adult had ever used the F word on me. Combined with his tone, expression, and body language, that word just cut me to the bone. I want it back, he said. Numbly, my heart hammering, I quietly and obediently went to my closet and dug out the balled up centerfold from beneath the pile of ninja turtles. I held it out to him and he snatched it. At this point, he went on a low, whispery rant at me, including a lecture about thievery and personal property. I don't remember all of it, but it went along the lines of, I'll tell your parents, I'll call the cops, you'll go to juvie. But he said two phrases I distinctly remember. One was, don't ever come in my house again. Don't even step foot in my yard again. And the other was something that was so strange, said with so much sincerity, that it burnt into my memory, and still haunts me to this day. Don't ever look at this crap again. He clenched his fists around the balled up centerfold. It will turn you into something you don't want to be. Then he turned and walked silently out of my room. I was so creeped out about how silent he slipped away. Our floors were carpeted, but he literally made no sound as he disappeared down the hall into the darkness, like some malicious Santa Claus. It was like he had lots of previous practice at sneaking around, which I found even more disturbing. When I thought back on the incident during the following years, it was that sneaking which haunted me most of all, even more than the lecture and the threats. How quietly and stealthily he moved, like the Grinch in the cartoon, but not with that big cartoony stride. Like I would never be safe from him no matter where I went in life. Like any time I went to sleep, he could just appear right there without a sound, and I'd never hear him coming. The aftermath of this story is a whole story in itself. I won't get into all the details, but just summarize it. No sign of forced entry or evidence of him being there was ever found by me or anyone else. I never told anyone until I got really close to a few good friends my freshman year of high school. My parents never found out about the incident. I was convinced that I would be in so much trouble if they ever found out that I just figured it was better to live in fear than face the consequences. Obviously, Parker's dad never mentioned it to either of them, but of course he wouldn't, that trespassing creep. I'm 35 years old now and have a good relationship with them, but I still can't bring myself to tell them what happened that night. I was emotionally damaged for a while. I had fear and anxiety and shyness issues. My grades slipped badly that year. I had a hard time sleeping at night after that and was tired all the time because I had chronic nightmares. My parents got me some prescription sleeping aids and I couldn't sleep in the dark again until I was at least 15 or 16. I always had to have a lamp on my bedside. I couldn't go near Parker's end of the street from then on, much less in his yard or house if my parents drove me by the house, I would simply point my head towards the opposite side of the street and pretend to be looking out the window. My family moved two years later in 1991, and I never saw Parker again after that. I asked my dad sometime later if he always locked the doors at night. 
He says, yes, most of the time, but sometimes I forget. I asked him if he made sure all the windows were locked at night, and he said that no, sometimes our mum opened them, and he forgot to lock them back when she closed them. So that answers the question as to how he got in the house. I still get queasy when I see porn. On one hand, like any red-blooded male, images of the internet of attractive women wearing no clothes catch my eye. But when I really start to stare and get into the moment, the fear of that night starts creeping back in. The unanswered questions. How did he even find out I had the page? Had he gotten home, seen his magazines weren't in proper order, and grilled Parker about it? Why the hell would this guy make such a fuss? and go to some extreme measures just to retrieve one torn out page of an old playboy. Makes no sense. What did he mean by, it will turn you into something you wouldn't want to be? A trespasser? An asshole who terrorizes kids? A porn addict? Was what he did to me that night, in some weird ass way, his twisted attempt to try and do something altruistic to me? To warn me off from becoming like him? How does a guy have so much balls? Seriously. My parents were asleep, one room away. My dad was a big dude, bigger than him. And my dad would have thrown that man right through a wall if he had caught him in my room in the middle of the night. Regardless, malicious Santa Claus, overprotective porn collector, terrorizer of children, and source of my nightmares, and scar on my childhood. Let's not meet again. This happened a very long time ago, back in 1973. I know it was summer, and that I was six years old. We were living on Monica Lane, in Madison, Wisconsin. The thing is, I sort of recalled it, but never put two and two together, until a few months ago, when I was talking to my mum, who went into it in great detail. I was a very gregarious child, outgoing, extroverted, friends with anyone. It was at that time a middle-class neighborhood, and three houses down from Mars, on the same side of the street, was a huge park. My mum was a nurse, and my dad was a salesman. But my mum worked second shift to Merita, while my dad worked days. I rarely had a babysitter, only if they went out for dinner or a movie. But they did go out often, and there were always older kids in the neighborhood to babysit. One sitter who I really liked lived a few blocks away or so, and down the street a little. Vicky had babysat me a few times before, and everything was pretty uneventful. She'd play games with me, and do my hair, play dress up, pretty basic stuff. So anyhow, one day, I had gone with my friends down to the park. I remember there was a ball field at the time and a sandlot next to the field. My friends wanted to play on the monkey bars, but I wanted to play in the sand. I looked at the sandbox and saw that my babysitter Vicky was standing there. I told my friends I was going to go down to the sandbox and ran off. We played in the sand building a castle and then she asked me if I wanted to get something cold to drink. It was stifling hot, and of course I say yes. So she takes my hand and we start walking to her place. She starts telling me about her puppies and asking if I wanted to play with them. Of course I get giddy and now can't wait to get to her house. This is where my memory stopped, and after my mom filled me in, the rest of it flooded back. My mother just happened to be talking to my sister and I about some of the places we lived at, and we got to Monica Lane. I told her I remembered the park and how big it seemed, and she asked me if I remembered being kidnapped. I immediately thought she was kidding, and then the look on her face told me otherwise. She said it was around five in the afternoon, that one of my friends had come to the door to ask me to come back outside, sure that I had gotten bored and walked back home. When my mother checked the house, she realized I wasn't there, 
and was seven months pregnant with my sister. She sprints to the park screaming my name. After asking several kids if they'd seen me with no clue, she went off to the ball field and asked the older boys if they'd seen me. One of the boys, who was around 14, said that he'd seen a younger woman playing with a girl that fit my description in the sand and walked off in that general direction. But that was all he knew. My mum ran across the street to one of the houses and asked to use their phone and call the police. By the time the police got there, my dad had come home and some of the neighbours were trying to help my mum. So there's this search party out looking for me, screaming my name and knocking on doors. The police had gone back to the park to ask the boys if they knew who had been with me and if they knew who she was. Between the boys and the neighbours, they had deduced who it was that had led me off, but I have no idea how. The police and the entourage go to her home as she lived with her parents but they weren't home and knocked on the door. She came to the door and told them that she hadn't seen me and that she'd been home all day. The police asked to come in and for some reason she said it was fine. They went through the house and found me in the basement. That's what my mum knew and then I remembered. It was literally like a floodgate had opened and I started crying. At six, you sort of trust everyone, and she'd been in our home. I'd never got a bad feeling from her, and my parents didn't either. But when we walked into her house, I remember that cold feeling washing over me and getting very worried. I remember starting to cry and saying I wanted to go home over and over. She takes me into her kitchen and gets me a glass of water and a tissue. I hear dogs barking, and next to the kitchen is an open stairway that goes down and that's where the barks were coming from. She then starts trying to make me go downstairs, telling me there's all sorts of toys and games. I reluctantly agree, and she grabs my hand and heads down the stairs. The dogs are going nuttier, and I start screaming. At this point, Vicky is getting bizarre. She's screaming at me to shut up, and that if I don't, she'll throw me in the cage with the dogs and they'll eat me, dragging me down the stairs while I scream. I was scared out of my mind. I remember crying so hard that I was hyperventilating and I'm screaming so hard I can't even make a sound. Vicky then flips a switch and starts being syrupy sweet trying to calm me down. She tells me that she was just playing a game and that she wants to play hide and seek. She must have been relatively skilled at calming me down because the next thing I know I hear knocking on the door upstairs and I wasn't crying. The houses were all the same sort of tract houses that Sears used to sell. So not huge, but not small. And you could hear everything at any spot in the house. I keep hearing the knocking and she tells me that it's her friend. They're coming to play hide and seek. And she convinced me to let her put a piece of masking tape over my mouth so that I wouldn't make a sound and lifted me into this big wooden box next to the kennel. She put a big pile of blankets over me and told me to be really quiet so they don't find me. The whole time the dogs were going crazy, but then she calmed me down. They calmed down too. They still looked incredibly mean, but were no longer frothing at the mouth and only slightly growling, until the knocking started. I remember scrunching in there confused, still scared and convinced that the dogs were going to get out and eat me. I was crying again and hyperventilating. I remember taking the tape off my mouth because I couldn't breathe, but remembered I needed to be quiet because I was afraid of what she'd do to me if I screamed. I laid in that smelly box next to a big bag of dog food, sweating to hell, tears rolling down my face. I sort of pushed the blankets side to side, only enough that I could pull them back over me when someone came. I recall thinking about my dad and wondering if he would come to find me. All of a sudden, I hear what sounds like adults yelling my name. They come down the stairs, and the dogs are going crazy. Over and over, men are yelling my name. And I swear I hear a man say that if she doesn't shut up those dogs, that he will. I was in a large storage box, like a carpenter toolbox type thing, with tape hanging off my mouth when they opened the lid. I remember a very nice man asking my name and if I was okay. I don't remember answering him in anything other than screams and tears and grabbing his neck so hard my dad had to practically pry me off him. I remember my parents taking me to the hospital to be checked out 
and that's all I remember really. Mum said that Vicky was found guilty of attempted kidnapping, and last she knew was that she was in prison, but couldn't remember when the last time that she heard anything was. We moved from the area shortly after, and have not been back since. I do know that Mum said her parents were odd, but that they didn't really know them. She had met Vicky from neighbours that had used her as a babysitter and had never heard of anything bad, and I always seemed happy with her. She lived in the general neighbourhood, but it would have been two blocks over and one block down. Mum said they never picked her up. She always walked over. When they drive home, they drive her home but would never notice anything out of the ordinary. Mum and Dad had only met her parents when they came to the door to ask for forgiveness, that Vicky hadn't meant to do anything bad and was a good girl. Mum said that my dad picked her dad up by the shirt and told them that if they ever came on our property again, he'd kill them. I remember her name and sort of what she looked like, but would have no idea if she walked up to me today. This happened in 2005 during Christmas vacation. I moved away for college and came back home to visit for the holidays and spent a week in my hometown in a snowy state. On my last night there, my friend and I decided to go sledding at 3 a.m. We get in her car and both go down a few times. We're both at the top of the hill. She gets ready to go again, but I stop her. She asks what's wrong. And I tell her that I had a bad feeling. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up and I felt nervous. I told her we needed to leave now, and we drive back to my family home. We lived in a town where no one locked their doors. The crime was almost nothing, and all the neighbours knew each other. When we got back, something told me to lock all our doors. Then I checked the windows, and several were unlocked. My flight was only four hours away to go back to campus and I slept for maybe two. I wanted to see the snow and smell the fresh air, so I stepped outside. I looked at a huge pine tree we had in the front yard of our house and always thought the way snow laid on the branches looked so beautiful, when something caught my eye. What should have been pure, fresh snow was littered in huge, man-sized footprints. They wrapped around the tree and went towards the backyard. I was thinking maybe my uncle had been out there smoking or something, just trying to rationalize those prints in any way. The same feeling came back to me when we were sledding, the anxious and paranoid feeling in the pit of my stomach. I look to my left and I see a man. He's running, sprinting, staring straight at me, probably close to 300 pounds and maybe six foot and for his size he was super fast. I froze in fear with the realization he's not doing a morning jog and that I was his target. I tried to move several times, but I was almost too scared. With everything in me, I opened the front door, slammed it shut and locked it. I ran to the window and looked onto my porch to see the man standing there. He had his hand on my door. He turns his head and I follow his gaze to a man in a white van. The guy in the van throws up his hands in a gesture to say, Well? The runner just threw up his hands and shook his head. The runner then walks to the van, gets in and they drive away. My heart still pounding. I wake up my friend and make her walk around the house with me. There we find the footprints. Went to every door and window around my house. She too tried to rationalize it, but to me, I know that if they had reached me, I wouldn't be sharing this with you today. The malicious look on his face as he ran told me everything I needed to know. My family moved to a different state right as I started high school. Our new house was only a few years old on a beautiful lot with a golf course nearby, and it was the biggest house we'd ever lived on. I had my own bedroom and bathroom, and needless to say, I was super excited to live there. And the first night in my new room, I was visited by the sleep paralysis demon. It was horrifying, 
because I'd never had sleep paralysis before, but after moving in, and throughout the entire time I lived there, I suffered from sleep paralysis episodes nearly every single night. Just in that room though, if I fell asleep on the couch, I would be fine. I would always see a partially vicious shadow figure pretty much every time I turned off the light in my room at night. I wish I could adequately describe the terror of this thing. You could just feel how it absolutely hated you and wished you harm, even when the lights were on. It was like it was always there, just hiding in the deepest shadows, waiting for its chance to come out. So, when there wasn't any lights, I could see the shadow figure clearly standing in the corner, or in front of the window, or in the doorway. I had a mirror in my room, and that was the most unnerving place to see it. I always kept a light on in my room, and that kept most of the nastiness away. My little brother, whose bedroom was next to mine, didn't have such luck. Unlike me, who really only got spooked at night, my brother's bedroom was legit haunted. It didn't matter to me what time of day it was, or that the lights were on or off. It was always frightening to go into that room. Even passing by the door was uncomfortable. Once you stepped inside, an unwelcoming chill enveloped you, and you felt like you were being watched by something evil, like honestly, truly evil. Something so wretched and malicious that you just somehow knew if you're caught by this thing, you'd be hurt or killed or something worse. Like if your soul had instincts, then they'd be screaming at you to run. And that's just how it felt the drop off laundry in the middle of the day. It was so, so much worse at night. Unlike me, who had a measly shadow figure to contend with, my brother had something actually manifest at night. I'm not really sure how to describe this entity. Terrifying, vicious, mean, evil. It both had a form, but also didn't. It was like the embodiment of hatred and ill intention. Everyone in my family had encounters with this entity. My parents saw it right after we moved in, and they went into my brother's room to set up his bed. I would often catch glances of it when I passed his bedroom and the door was ajar. My sister saw it and she went inside to help with chores. It was suffocating being in that room. My brother spent only a few nights in his room before moving in with my youngest brother. He only kept some clothes in there, otherwise he never went inside. Like I mentioned before, I moved into that house just in time for my freshman year of high school, so ninth grade and I found a wonderfully idealistic circle of friends. I just had the best time with these nerds. Like Ali, introduced us to the Japanese version of Sailor Moon with violence. Anyway, as all young girls do, we decided to have a sleepover and I happily volunteered my house for the occasion. I was super pumped. My mum helped me prepare snacks and everything. And on that fateful night, me, Ali, Christina, Whitney and Tiffany all congregated in the basement living room which we all called the den, with the intention of staying up all night. After fangirling about whatever for a few hours, we had the bright idea to play some night games, but since it was the fall, it was kind of a little too cold to comfortably play outside. Christina was always the de facto leader of our group, and she decided that we should play hide and seek, but we had to play with the lights off, otherwise it would be too easy. We weren't children after all. We set up some ground rules. The only off-limits place was my parents' room, or my older sister's room. But since my two younger brothers were going to join us, we would invade their rooms without the risk of bothering them. We played a few rounds, each of us taking it in turns being it, and it was so much fun. Dead silence, and then the happy squeal of someone being discovered. And then, it was my turn to be the seeker. I found Ali under a pile of blankets in the den, Whitney was under the kitchen table, Tiffany in the laundry room, and my brothers were in the downstairs storage room. But where was Christina? At first it was funny. Wow, she's good at hiding. Must have found a great spot. Okay, it's been like 10 minutes, come out now. I enlisted the rest of the group to help look for Christina. We searched the house from top to bottom, except for my brother's super haunted room. I just poked my head in and called out Christina. And when no response was forthcoming, I quickly backed out and shut the door. After 30 minutes of searching, we really started to get concerned, like we were considering waking up my parents to help find her. It was no longer funny. But before I bothered them, I decided to steal my nerves and really search my bedroom. And if she wasn't in there, 
then perhaps my brother's room. I had to be sure she wasn't in there before getting the authorities, as in my parents, involved. Anyway, I marched in there and flipped on my lamps. There was a hush in there that didn't feel like the usual level of creepiness that I'd somehow gotten used to. It really felt like something was unsettlingly wrong. I suddenly somehow knew Christina was in my brother's room, even though we had checked it before. I didn't actually dare go inside that room, dread and fear clawing at me, so I asked all my friends to come in with me. We pulled the door open, flipped on the lights and stepped in. It was dead silent and cold. There was almost a prickling sensation that washed over us when we walked in, as if we'd walked through some kind of sharp cobweb. Instantly, a terror enveloped us like a perverse nausea, as if there was something truly evil laughing silently at us. And it was scary. It was so scary standing in that room, even with the lights on, even surrounded by friends. I looked under the bed, and without direct light casting the shadow away, it was unnaturally pitch black under there. Christina? I called, but there was no answer. I didn't look closer. I was too frightened to stare into the dark for longer. Instead, I looked at my brother's desk. At first, I didn't see anything, but it was like there was an unnatural visual distortion, like a ripple in the shadows, and that's when I saw her, Christina. My headstrong, fearless friend was curled underneath the desk, shaking and sobbing uncontrollably. I hadn't seen her like that before. I hadn't even heard her like that before, none of us had. But as soon as we saw her, everyone rushed to comfort her. She was pale and very obviously not okay. I remember exactly what her words were and how she replied in a shaky, weak voice. Christina, what happened? Are you all right? I, I saw a ghost. We got her out of there and I ended up waking up my mum because us teenage girls weren't equipped to help Christina calm down. In the end, Christina opted not to go home. Later, I learnt her mother was very abusive to her, which may have contributed to why she was so highly affected by the dark entity in my brother's room. And we spent the rest of the evening subdued in the basement, as far away from the haunted room as possible with all the lights on. Christina was absolutely traumatised from the encounter, and it took several months before she could even talk about what happened. Basically, she went into my brother's room, hid under the desk, but then the dark, evil entity that haunts the room held her down and prevented her from leaving. It spoke to her in some sort of dark language, clearly using words to tear her down. It stood in front of the desk, preventing her from leaving. She was stuck in what felt like hell for half hour until we found her. The entire time I knew her, she never could bring herself to actually describe what the thing looked like. It would just spook her out way too much. It's one thing to have something scary happen to you, but it feels so different when your best friend is traumatized like that. It was definitely scary as hell, and I don't wish it upon anyone. I'm a 31 year old woman. This happened a few years back. I was walking from a friend's house to meet my son's father, X, at a bar we frequented in those days. It was winter, icy, and snowing with giant piles of snow all around. I was walking from a friend's house at around 9pm, down Nelly, that served as a driveway area for many houses. Not a great neighbourhood, but not particularly bad either. I was wearing my apocalypse boots, waterproof, knee-high, winterproof. I usually have headphones and blaring music as I walk, but for some reason that night, I decided not to. In hindsight, that was what saved me. I'm about the equivalent of two to three blocks away from the bar. There's a younger guy in his early 20s walking about 50 feet behind me. Hey, you! I turn around. It seems he's talking to someone else. Hey! I look back, then continue walking. Yeah, you. No, don't turn around, sweetheart. I start to walk faster, as I realise he's getting closer. Ahead of me, I see an SUV running, backed out of a parking spot, but blocking my path. I turn around, and there's another guy. The door to the SUV opens, and there's a couple of guys in it looking at me. One guy gets out and stands by the open door. I turn to look at the guy behind me. 
Out of nowhere, about five more guys come out surrounding me from a distance, slowly closing in. The realization that they were hiding behind piles of plowed snow just hit me. I realize they are just standing and watching me. A couple of them had their phones out and were recording something that was about to go down. Someone was smiling and closing in on me, trying to get me to walk to the SUV. Fight or flight kicked in and I decided I didn't want to know what was about to happen. I wanted to catch them off guard. So instead of running forward, I bolted to the left. Thank God for those boots. I could run across the ice no problem and ended up cutting through a few yards and made it to the bar. The guys were trying to get me into the SUV while filming and I'm sure I wouldn't be here today had I not run that way. The first time I saw a ghost, I was 18. I was working at a care center, and one of my favorite residents was named Maud. She ate the same breakfast every day, toast with butter and grape jelly. So around 9 a.m. I got her toast ready. At 9.15 she came down, and she was a little late, but no worries. I said good morning, and set the toast down in front of her. She nodded, I smiled, and went back to the kitchen. I came out later to an empty table, with untouched toast sitting there. That was weird, so I asked my CNA where Maud went. She looked at me sadly. Honey, didn't you hear? Maud passed away about a half hour ago. She died peacefully. Her kids were in her room when she passed. It was really beautiful. I looked at the clock. It was 9.45, exactly a half hour since Maud came down for breakfast. Maud was as real to me as the table I set her toast on. If I had reached out, I swear I could have touched her, but it obviously wasn't the physical her. And I have believed in ghosts ever since. Of course it helps that my co-workers and I can still see them all the time. I was babysitting one night for a family friend about four years ago. I had put the kids to bed and crashed on the couch while waiting for my mum and the friend to get back from a night out. Randomly, I woke up and just remember being very confused about why I was even awake. That was until I heard the front door close. A key thing to note here is the fact the only sound was the door closing. There was no sound of it being locked, and this lock was very loud. I assumed it was my mum and her friend coming back, so I sat up preparing to leave. However, I quickly noticed the lack of their voices. They are never quiet after a night out especially because their friend has always had some drinks and also noticed that there was only one set of footsteps. For a moment, I considered the possibility of it being the friend's husband coming home to grab something. He was a firefighter and was at the station for one of his 24-hour shifts. I could hear the person walking around the front room, then going to the table in there and shuffling through some papers as if frantically searching for something. The more I listened, though, the more it just didn't feel right. I pretty quickly dropped the idea of it being the husband and jumped to the idea of it being an intruder. Being around 15 at the time, I was no way brave enough to confront any intruder that broke into the house. I managed to scoot along a wall leading to the front room before becoming completely paralyzed by fear. I ended up promising myself I would keep my presence hidden until the person walked upstairs to the kids or back towards me. I could hear them pacing around a lot, papers and items being shuffled though. Eventually, I heard the footsteps start to come down the hall before turning into the bathroom, which was before they could reach me on the stairs. Only seconds after the footsteps walked into the bathroom, I heard the front door unlock. This ties back to the beginning, because it really struck out the door was never locked and I can remember every single sound from the second I woke up. Immediately I heard my mum and the friend talking loudly, and part of me was relieved, while the other part of me was prepared to hear them scream upon finding an intruder in the bathroom that's too small to hide in. Shockingly, they just walked straight past it, and mum told me to get my stuff so that we could go home. I was still listening the entire time, and the bathroom door never closed, and no further footsteps were heard. As I finally walked down the hall to the door, I scanned the bathroom. 
The door was wide open. The window was shut, and it was too small to fit anyone but kids through, and there was no one crouched in the darkness. There was absolutely nothing off about the house, no windows open in any of the first floor, and nobody left between my mum coming back and us leaving. Nothing. I'm a skeptic. I like to think this may have been an intruder, but cannot think of any logical way they could have hid there and left somehow. The friend never found an intruder or noticed any missing items. Nothing makes sense. All I know is that night is vividly ingrained in my mind, too vividly to be a dream. Then I still get that feeling of something not being right whenever I think about it. Back when I was in college about seven years ago, I had to move from an apartment to another last minute because, well, I was a lazy college student and hadn't made any plans. My parents were in town, so we were looking for something quick. Fortunately, we found something pretty cheap and somewhat nice right in front of the university. They were thrilled. I was just happy this was all over. So I move in this kind of four-room basement, which was already furnished. They said the last tenant cancelled last minute, and I only needed it for the three months of the summer, so he was giving us a great deal. The first room was the main room, which consisted of a living room and a little table to eat. Immediately on the right of it was the kitchen and the bathroom. The bathroom was on the left, and there was some kind of weird and small hall slash connection joining it to the living room. Since the start, I always kind of felt uneasy about that bedroom for some reason, and preferred to sleep in the living room since there was already a comfy sofa bed in there and there were no windows in the bedroom. Throughout the semester, I felt countless times that someone was watching me from the bedroom when I was alone, either watching TV or playing video games. It was weird, and every feeling to the point where I preferred closing the doors leading to the bedroom altogether. I wasn't home that much, and sometimes I slept at friends, but every time I came back it felt like I wasn't alone in that apartment. There was never any sound or sights. Just a strange feeling. I spoke of it to my friends and they laughed, since I was never the superstitious kind. So I kind of brushed it off the whole time, and thought nothing of it when I finished the semester. I kind of just moved on with life. About two years ago, one of my friends from college texted me. Hey, is 17 the door number you lived at in that creepy basement back at uni? Yeah, why? He then sent me a picture of an old local newspaper page. He had been looking through them at the library, looking for a picture of him back in his college football days. It was the obituary section from 2009. The picture of a young and good-looking female student Next to her picture was the picture of a door and address which I recognised very well. Turns out, she hung herself in her bedroom closet. I'm a 21 year old female, and this story took place when I was around 11. I remember this day clearly because it was the first time I was ever allowed to walk to school and back by myself. Up until the age of 14, I lived in what we thought was a safe place in Chacatua County, New York. Everyone knew everyone. If you thought you could get away with something, then be prepared to have your ear abused by the time you got home. There was this one day, though. It was a cold winter day, and school, unfortunately, was still open, so all the neighborhood kids had to walk through knee-height inches of snow just to get to school. It took me longer to leave the house as I was used to walking with my older sisters to school since she knew the route better than me. I always used to make fun of her for being paranoid and taking different routes every day from school. But after that day, I learned that was what saved my life. As I was waiting by the door to leave, my mum came up to me and told me that I should ride with her to drop me off because my sister was too sick to go in today. Being a brat, I made a big deal about walking by myself because I was almost 12 years old and all my friend's parents let them walk alone. She looked at me for a long while, then told me to make sure I paid attention to cars. I got hit by a car and almost died when I was nine, so the worry that showed on her face was well warranted. Hurriedly, I nodded 
and headed out the door to go to school. My sister didn't like to dilly-dally, so she was always in a rush to get to school early. But seeing as it was just me, I thought it would be a good idea to take my time. I would play in the brown slush that was left on the side of the road, and even make funny-looking snowballs to see how far I could throw them. Halfway to school, I noticed a white van following behind me. Being the playful child I was, if I had not been bending down to make another snowball, I wouldn't have noticed it slowly creeping up the street. I told myself I was being stupid, but continued more hurriedly to school. Once I got to school, I took a quick glance over my shoulder and saw the van a few feet behind me. It wasn't until I was on school grounds that it drove away fast by me. I thought that would be the end of it. But throughout the day when I would stare out the window, the van would be there. I assumed that it never really left, just parked. Many adults would try to convince me years later that maybe it wasn't the same one, but I knew it was. The van had a bright yellow smile emoji sticker on it. I couldn't see who was in the van, but through the tinted glass I knew they could see me. It was now the end of the day, and I wasn't ready to go home. It was too late to call my mum because she was at work and my sister was at home sick. I had to suck it up and start walking. I tried to blend in with a group of kids, but most of them were car riders, and the others didn't live near me. Remembering what my sister told me, I took another route home. I didn't memorize this route clearly, but I decided anything was better than being spotted by the van. I made it to my main street, but realized my mistake too late. The route I took led back to the main street where I walked to school. Hidden behind a row of cars was the white van with the smiley sticker emoji. I tried to stay calm and walk past, but once I heard the van door slightly open, I ran. I could hear the rush of two pairs of heavy footfalls behind me. They were getting closer, so I did what any normal kid would do. I cut corners. I cut into someone's backyard until I was directly in sight of my house and forced myself into the thick snow to make it to the door. My heart was racing, not because I was running, but because I could still hear them behind me. I made it to the door and banged with all my might until someone came to the door. My sister looked confused, but one look at my face and she pulled me inside and locked the doors. The van was still outside. Truthfully, it stayed out there until my brother got home. Me and my sister don't talk about it, but we both knew how close it was for me to go missing. I hadn't thought about this incident in years, but one of my hometown friends showed me an article that came out in 2013. Apparently some men kidnapped and sexually assaulted a girl my age. It wouldn't have scared me if I hadn't mentioned the white van. Whoever you are that attempted to kidnap me, and do God knows what else, let's not meet. I'm a security guard for an alarm response company. We answer alarms for businesses and private residences. 99% of the time it's a motion detector set off by a cat, or a restaurant forgot to disarm their staff before the stock truck arrived to unload. In this case, I was called out to a house where the back door alarm was set off, like it thought someone had opened it. The owner was out of town, but she was alerted by her app and had her mother meet me there. We checked the door it's locked and figured that maybe someone tried the door but it didn't budge, setting off the alarm. But there's a light on inside. The mum mentions this to her daughter on the phone and the daughter says she isn't sure if she left the light on or not. It's a good idea to make people think someone's home, but she just isn't sure. That gave me a bad tingle. The mother wanted to go inside to check However, she didn't have a spare key. The neighbor did, but they were asleep and the mum didn't want to wake them. So I fill out my papers and go back to my normal patrol route. An hour later, the same home sends an alert out. I'm the only one in my city zone, so I answer it again. When I pull up, police and CSI are there talking to the mother and the now awake neighbor. They are reviewing video footage sent to them by the daughter. I look at the footage four armed men wearing masks and hoodies came out of the bathroom a minute after the mother and i left they proceeded to rob the place 
They had broken in and locked the door behind them for appearances. They're the ones who turned on the light. The mother told me three guys had robbed her daughter's home a month before. Somehow they knew when the girl would be out of town. They appeared smart, desiring a quiet robbery without conflict, but they brought guns, so they were prepared to shoot their way out of trouble if need be. The mother had wanted to go in. If she had a key, or woken the neighbor for the key, we would have likely been shot dead by these guys when we went inside. Work doesn't give me Kevlar vests or anything. If I ever get another house call and someone is there, I'm not going inside no matter what. I count myself fortunate the way was blocked this time because I was prepared to foolishly go in and check if I could. The 1% of calls where something is actually off, it has never been as bad as this one. To the armed robbers, let's not meet. One night in 2005, I was laying in my bed reading a book or playing on my laptop. I can't remember. My younger sister was asleep a few feet away and my mum was downstairs drinking and playing tapes on the stereo in the living room. I heard what sounded like a girl say, Mum? Mum? My mum turned the stereo off and went to the bottom of the stairs and shouted, What is it, Sandy? My little sister. I stepped onto the landing and said, Mum, she's asleep. What was that? Sounded like a little girl. My mum said, yeah, I heard it too. To this day, I don't know what it was, but there is a story about our property that a little girl was autistic and was kept in a shack with her grandmother on the back part of the property. I don't know how true the story was, but it fit. Was it the ghost girl calling for her mother? The only thing I can say is that it absolutely happened. I grew up in a house that had a few spirits in it. My family are all skeptics and would find some way to explain things away. A few experiences and then I'll get onto the main story. One. Our house was three stories with technically three master bedrooms, one on each floor. The one on the main floor we used as an office. I would constantly hear someone walking around in the office at night sinks turning on, toilets flushing, and occasionally talking. My parents would always say that someone was awake and making these noises, and the toilet and water running were just faulty pipes. Two, there would be a shadow figure that would pace on the top floor. There was a balcony that overlooked the foyer, and I would usually see who I presumed was a lady in a dress pacing. My parents just said it was a shadow of someone outside. As we are on a hill, overlooking all our neighbors. I personally don't understand how this would be possible. Three, I hated using the upstairs bathroom, which was my bathroom. I would hear talking and singing from the bathroom. When no one was home and I was there, I would occasionally hear bangs on the door. One time I was showering and listening to music and I heard the bang very loudly, so loudly it shook the room. Then the locked door swung open and finally I heard a scream. My parents said my brother was pranking me, which is something he never did. But let's get on to the main event. My brother is about 10 years older than me. He was the only sibling living at the house with me and my parents. He had the master bedroom in the basement. I was never really in the basement except for maybe going into the garage because it was in the basement next to his bedroom. I always remember feeling uneasy down there but I wanted a big room. So when my brother moved out, I begged my parents to let me have his room, and eventually they caved and let me have it. I moved all of my things downstairs, painted and everything, and I loved my new room. I was talking to my brother about it one day, and he told me, watch out for the little girl who lives down there. She likes to laugh. I was shocked, and obviously he was just kidding. My whole family besides me never talked about stuff like that. I just laughed and shrugged it off. He was probably trying to scare me. About a week after I moved into my new room, I had a friend come over, and we were just laying on the floor next to the bathroom, laughing, when she had to go to the bathroom. She closed the door, 
and I was just zoning out when all of a sudden she goes, Hey, that's not funny. I asked her what she meant. I didn't do anything. She said she heard someone laughing right outside the door, but I didn't do anything or hear anything either. She left freaked out, and assumed my brother put her up to it, since she liked my brother. A few days later, I hear someone in my bedroom while I'm in the shower. I call out thinking it's my mum, but I didn't hear anything. I get out, and as I'm putting my robe on, I hear a little girl giggle, and then, are you looking for me? I freak out, throw open the door to the room, but no one is there. I check the garage, and ended up setting off the house alarm, so no one could have come or gone through those doors without everyone knowing. I ran upstairs, and my mum is pissed that I set off the alarm but then I tell her what happened. She told me my brother had a very similar story when we first moved in, but it was nothing. So I called my brother and asked him why he told me to watch out for the little girl. He said I was the little girl. He was kidding because you would always come downstairs and giggle really creepy. I never did anything like that. I told him that, and he got a little creeped out. I will still occasionally hear the girl. I never saw her but she did like to laugh and open the bathroom door and closet. I called her Sarah. My brother called me up today and asked me about this. He asked me if I was sure I never tried to scare him by laughing and told him no. He became uncomfortable. I don't think he knows how to handle the fact that our house was mildly haunted. <laughs> One time I was babysitting in the middle of nowhere, up at the mountains of the coast. I remember it was around 9pm, and the kids' parents would be getting home in like an hour or so. I had put the kids to bed, so was downstairs by myself watching TV. However, every so often the TV would flicker with static. To be honest, it was starting to scare the crap out of me. It wasn't until the point when I looked up from the TV to find the nearby window when I lost it. There wasn't actually anything outside, but it seemed as if it was in the reflection. I saw what looked like a tin man standing not too far from me behind the couch. Needless to say, there wasn't actually anything there when I snapped my head back around to look at the spot where it was standing in the reflection. I grabbed all my stuff and wanted to get out of that house, there and then. But I had to run upstairs and actually sat down quietly while the kids were sleeping and waited for them to return. For some reason, even though they were sleeping kids, being in company calmed me a bit. I particularly remember when the parents came home and I had started to leave. I was pulling out of their driveway in my terrible old Ford Laser, and I looked up into the kids' bedroom. The same reflection I saw earlier was looking back down at me with a raised hand, as if waving goodbye. And after that, I never babysat again. My siblings and I went on a ghost tour in Naperville, Illinois, from 8 to 10 p.m., November 1st, 2019. It was drizzling in around 35 degrees Fahrenheit. There was also leftover snow on the ground from the three inches we got the day before. This was my first tour where EMF detectors got provided for us. The detectors were the ghost meter brand. The detectors beeped and flashed, and I had my detector on at full volume the whole time. We got some beeps and blips throughout the tour, but it didn't get interesting until we arrived at the exact spot of the 1946 Naperville train disaster. The disaster left 45 dead, when an 80 mile an hour train rear-ended a stationary one. We were walking up the street where the public lined up the corpses and put body parts like puzzle pieces back together. All at once, everyone's detectors started going off when we were halfway down the block. Then our guide comes up to me and the conversation goes as follows. If someone's here, can you make this beep slower? And my detector beeps slow down. I say, can you make it stop? It stops. Everyone's detectors were still going on but mine. 
The detective still read a two. The guide asks, are you a World War II soldier? And the beeping started up again. When I ask, would you be surprised to know that the year is 2019? And the beeping stops abruptly. Then I ask again, were you on the train? The beeping starts again. We're sorry you died on the train. The guide then goes, you can go now, head to the light. Then all the detectors stopped, and the reading went down to zero. We all sat there in shock for a good 15 seconds. We might have just helped a spirit move on. I've always been interested in the paranormal, but have never been a full believer in ghosts. Being there and having this happen to me on my EMF has definitely made me think different now. I live in a not-so-large, not-so-friendly block of flats. Well, it's really more of a converted old Victorian house, which is now modified into five small flats per block, with there being four blocks and me living in the second one. Just for some context, the main door is really crappy and still hasn't been replaced even though the entire building has been refurbished. This is the case despite the landlord promising it would be done by New Year. Anyway, this door doesn't lock when you close it. It has to be locked manually, either by the key from the outside or by the twisty lock on the inside. Unfortunately, the people who live around me can be, well, let's say rude, and that's putting it kindly. They're always blasting music until late, setting off the fire alarm which is linked in every flat, and it's super loud and annoying. I smoking inside most of the time. However, the most annoying thing always, and I mean always, is leaving the main door unlocked. This was something, nothing more than annoying up until very recently, when something truly horrific happened as a result. It was a Thursday night, and as usual I was getting ready for bed at around 11pm. And as per usual, despite it being a weekday, one of the surrounding flats in a different block to mine was throwing a party. This was annoying and unfair. Come on guys, for real, who throws a party on a Thursday? I mean, just wait for Friday. Not only that though, it's supposed to be lockdown, so while other people can't even see their families, me included, you get to keep everyone up. The music was noticeable, but not super loud from the comfort of my bedroom, thankfully. So I do what I always do when I go to bed. I put on some scary stories to help me chill out and sleep. So I finally managed to drift off at around midnight and I awoke for the first time at around two because of the music. So I growl and begrudgingly get up to go to the bathroom, as I thought I may as well as I'm already up. So annoyed and frustrated, I get back into bed and continue to enjoy my stories until I'm asleep once more. I'm suddenly awoken by loud stomps coming up the stairs. I live at the very top of the building, so the final staircase only leads to my door. Now I'm more exhausted than angry, so I just lie there awake until I hear something that jolts my half-asleep brain fully awake. My door is being pushed. Someone is actually trying to push open my door and enter my flat, without my permission. Not hard or forcefully, mind you. Not like they were trying to break it down, but they definitely tried to gain entry. Now this may be just because my mind was still foggy, or that I was still so tired that I didn't care, but I stupidly assumed it was some drunken party goer who had mistakenly gone to the wrong block. Maybe the party was at a different top floor flat, so I ignored them. Even when it happened again and I could hear scratching and mumbling on the other side of the door. Stupid, I know, but I really wanted to sleep. So the next morning I woke up as usual and got ready for work. As I opened my door to leave, what do I see? Two men sleeping on the floor blocking my way, one bleeding from his head. And I'm not judgmental or at least try not to be, but these men were clearly homeless. I mean, the smell of one alone told me that it was like having a ball of dirt slapped in your face. Not ideal for an early morning start, when I eventually got one of them to get up, the other failed to do so. He was clearly on drugs and was completely out of it. 
Thankfully for me, the man was okay. I mean, I could have just been rushed, but they explained that they had been attacked and chased and took shelter here. I offered to call an ambulance, which the men eventually accepted, through a one-sided conversation of murmurs and groans. So I stepped out to get a better look at the man on the ground, and as I did, the other stepped inside my flat. I stared at him with our eyes locked, and he came right back out without incident as I locked my door. The ambulance eventually arrived. I had to dial 999 as there was no one manning the non-emergency number, probably because of the current pandemic, and I went to work informed the landlord and he would warn the other people living there apparently that they must keep the door locked. But of course, every morning I get to work and the door is wide open without consequence. But the real kicker is that because the guy was bleeding and homeless, I didn't want to clean it up myself. So I had to get a professional cleaner to do it. And when I asked for my landlord to chip in, he ignored me for a few days. And when he eventually got back to me, he said, it's only on the walks. Brilliant. So I ended up paying the whole thing myself because I just didn't feel comfortable with it being around me. Now I do not believe those men had intentions to hurt me. But what if I hadn't have locked my door? What if they had have gotten in? When people are desperate and opportunities present themselves, you really don't know what people will do. Two of them, one of me, alone, asleep, vulnerable. Pretty scary when you think about it. This happened to me when I was around seven. I'm currently 19 and have almost forgotten about it. But after reading and listening to many of these stories, it flooded back to my mind. So let me take you back 12 years. At the time I had a full-time nanny who lived with us. She was from a different country. So when she went back to her home country for visiting, we often got a temporary nanny. So that year she left for her yearly visit and a temporary nanny called Tina came to live with us. She was around her late twenties, decent looking, and the only thing about her that I remember was that she never really smiled much. So the week goes on, nothing really suspicious happened. The only thing that was weird was that whenever I came back from school, she was always sweating and breathing heavily. Never thought much of it back then. The weekend comes along and my parents were still young, so their Friday ritual was to head to the clubs after dinner. That night we had dinner out, they dropped me off, and I took the lift up to the house. As I got out of the lift, I noticed a man from the corner of my eye, but tried not to pay him any mind, because all I was thinking of was getting home before my show started. So I rush in just to see Tina crying. Being a kid, I ask her what was wrong, and she said nothing. I just left and continued my show. As I was watching my show, Tina said she was going to the shops for a bit and asked me to stay home and not move. Three minutes in, Tina runs back into the house crying, locked the door, ran into her room and locked herself in. I got my munchkin-like body out of the sofa confused as hell. Before I could get to Tina's room, someone began banging on the door. I didn't understand anything that was going on, as the guy was shouting in some random accent. Thinking back, it's probably some dialect from India. This went on for about half an hour, and Tina was nowhere in sight. So finally the ruckus stops and my curiosity gets the best of me. I unlock the door, ever so slightly, and peep through the gap. It was sort of dark, but it looked like a shadow was trying to hide behind the wall. I opened the door a little more and said, hello? I kid you not, at that very moment, this dude starts sprinting towards my door and I slammed and locked it immediately. I went straight to bed, hearing him going at the front door again for what seemed like forever, until eventually I fell asleep. I woke up in the morning with my mum's sweet voice. The weird part was that Tina acted as if nothing happened. I didn't tell my breakfast anything, but while having breakfast I heard my dad going on about how there had been many beer cans at the staircase when he came back early that morning. The day after Tina left, and my usual nanny returned, and everything came back to normal. I really wonder what that was all about, and how much danger I was in. When I was a 12-year-old kid, 
and after my parents' divorce, my dad was having a pretty rough time financially. We moved around a lot, and for a little while, him, my brother and I, were staying in this unfinished old basement apartment. The layout of the apartment was a little weird. It was like a large U-shape. I had my own room at one end, which was connected to the living room, where you would enter the apartment. My dad and brother, three years younger than I am, shared a room in the middle that you have to go through to get to the unfinished kitchen slash laundry room area on the other end. From the moment we first started staying there, I was afraid to go into my room. When I went in there, even for a moment, I felt like I was being watched. It was this very heavy, anxious feeling that only existed in that room in the house. I think I slept in there once or twice before I started asking my dad if I could just sleep in the living room instead, usually on the couch. Sometimes he would bring my bed mattress out there for me instead, as I just couldn't go into that room, not even during the day. I don't remember when it started, but one night I was sleeping on the couch, and I woke up to the sound of chains scraping on the concrete floor of the kitchen. It was loud, and it sounded like it was getting closer to me. I was just frozen and didn't move. Eventually, I saw a dark figure with sharp nails and bright red eyes slowly shuffle from the kitchen into my dad and brother's room and stand at the foot of their bed between the two doorways. I stood there for a bit, and then it turned to face me. I remember the eyes so vividly to this day, as I'm 30 now, and the heavy chains that hung from its clothing and dragged on the floor. He stood there for a while before shuffling out towards me in the living room, and then going into my bedroom through the open door. I remember seeing this figure a lot when I stayed there with my dad, and apparently at one point I asked my mum if I had to keep going there because I was afraid, but I don't remember that. I felt bad if that did happen though, because my dad would have no idea why I didn't want to go anymore. Still to this day I've only told two other people about it, an ex who just made fun of me because he was a dickhead, and my current boyfriend who doesn't believe in ghosts himself, but was willing to at least consider slash talk about my experience. I'm afraid even now that if I asked my dad or my brother if they ever saw anything strange in that house, they might say yes. It did stand at the foot of their bed, after all. And if they saw it too, then it definitely was real. Which honestly, terrifies me. When I was around 12, I lost my older cousin to cancer. He was only 27. About a year into his diagnosis, colon cancer, he was doing pretty badly. His prognosis was grim, and he knew he was going to die. But he was still able to live alone, visit with us, etc. He'd mow his own yard, swim, and do other basic things. He wasn't bedridden at this point. He was washing dishes when he heard a noise coming from his bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway across the living room. He walked to the edge of the kitchen and could see across the living room and down the hall. There was a person standing there. He said he felt no fear, but mostly curiosity, because no one should have been in his house. He also said it felt off. His subconscious knew something. It was something different, but that he shouldn't be afraid. He walked down the hall, and the woman was his great-grandma, not my side of the family, who had died when she was pretty young. She smiled at him and gestured into the bedroom, where two more women stood. He didn't recognize either of them. One smiled at him, the other had more of a stern look. They talked briefly. He asked if they were there because he was dying. They were, but she assured him that he still had a bit of time left. She said the other women were family, but didn't name them. She basically told him that she loved him and knew he was scared, but that she would be here for him when it was his time. Then they were gone. No fading or anything, just instantly no longer there. His fiance came home shortly after, and he was just sitting outside in the sun looking happy and calm. She thought he had good medical news. He said that after this experience, he just had so much less fear 
and it was like he had taken a pill that covered him in good feelings. He wasn't religious at all. He was very sure it wasn't a dream and wasn't under any treatment. He died about eight months later. As a kid, this scared me a lot. I was always afraid that if I dreamt about a deceased family member, it meant that I was going to die. I am currently at a college in Boston and have an apartment in the North End with my buddy. We're both 21-year-old males. My girlfriend came up for the weekend to visit and we were doing our normal weekend thing and drinking and just hanging out. My roommate convinced us to watch Green Inferno because it just made its way to Netflix and I've been meaning to watch it. Horribly messed up movie, but pretty good if you like a gruesome horror flick and don't mind bad acting. Three quarters of the way through the movie, I kept hearing this banging noise coming from what sounded like inside our building. At first I ignored it, thinking I was just hearing things or it was the noise from the busy main street that our apartment building is on. But after a few times, I thought I heard a girl scream. I paused the movie and asked my roommate and girlfriend if they heard it, and they both did. But we shrugged it off as random kids getting drunk. I heard it twice or more, and it wasn't sitting right with me. So I paused it and said to my roommate, Let's just take a walk down the stairs and check the halls. We left our place on the fourth floor and headed towards the stairs where we saw a man who looked to be in his mid to late twenties sitting on the stairs outside an apartment and he looked like he was a mess. We asked him if this was his place and he kind of said yes but not definitely and sounded a bit drunk. We had no reason not to believe him. So we went back to our room but right when we got back, I remember that the only people that lived in that unit were two or three girls, and my one roommate agreed. We decided to head back out there, and at this point my girlfriend was freaked out. We approached him again and asked him if he was sure this was his place. He stood up and said, yeah, and proceeded to aggressively bang on the door multiple times. When he stood up, I immediately noticed the poop stains on his white jeans and pointed it out to my roommate. We are both in shape guys and realized right away, if anything needed to happen, we could easily take this guy on. At this point, we both said that we think he should leave because it clearly wasn't his abode. I mean, the dude crapped himself. He looked at us back to the door where he tried five different keys in the lock. Obviously, none of them worked so we again firmly told him to leave the building. The whole time he really didn't argue with us and never gave us a firm answer, further proving our point that he was messed up and didn't belong here. At this point, something must have clicked in his head. He started heading down the stairs with us closely in tow, making sure he left while plugging our noses and gagging on the stench of his crapped pants. When we were in sight of the landing at the base of the stairs, the sight we saw made our stomachs drop. We saw a phone with earbuds on the top shelf that sits there, a hoodie strewn across the floor with a mask a few feet away, a satchel looking like bag even further away and a package that I had seen in the lobby earlier. As soon as I saw this, I thought the absolute worst and it looked like a struggle had taken place. I then asked him in an aggressive tone what he did and I could tell he was scared now. He refused to answer me and tried to bang and open the apartment on the first floor claiming that it was his place. He then went to collect his things from the floor and just to make sure, I made him unlock the iPhone in front of us to prove it. It was touched ID and he opened it. We did not like the way he was acting, so he kept insisting he should leave as he formed answers back that were barely English. After that, he proceeded to walk towards the back of the building in a rather brisk pace. There is a tighter staircase at the back which leads to all floors as well as an alley at the back of the building. This is probably the strangest part as very few people knew about this exit to our building but he headed there with speed and confidence. My roommate followed close behind to make sure he left and shut the back door firmly as once it's shut it can't be opened from the outside. I was far back 
gagging on the stench. After this, we went out the front door together and walked around to the back door to make sure the man was gone. We slipped a note under the door of the girls, saying we saw a man and made him leave, and to come knock or text us if they need anything, as we wanted to make sure they were okay. Luckily, this man left without any problem occurring between him and my roommates. And, as I imagine, that definitely could have ended in an ugly manner. We knew girls lived there, and this man was giving off terribly creepy vibes. We aren't oblivious. I knew there was a strong chance he had ill intent with these girls, so we needed to act. To the creepy man who was terrorizing the girls, please, let's not ever meet. And you might want to pick up some adult diapers. So, it turns out the girl who lives in the apartment was luckily not home when this all went down. She ended up texting us, so we explained what happened, and she was very freaked out. She called the landlord who got us to get our story, and she believes it could have been an old tenant who was subletting over the summer that constantly got locked out. He would come back drunk, bang on his door, and one time it actually broke down. It's hard to me to think it was the same guy, as he didn't start banging on the door until after we mentioned we knew a girl lived there. Also, this apartment is a floor above, and in a different spot than the one the old tenant was in. Queen Anne Hill in Seattle is so steep on the south end of it, it seems like about 40 degrees, that if there is any snow or ice on it, that section of road is closed and buses do not even attempt to service the area. You can still access it from the north end though. Well, one winter's day, with snow laying several inches thick on the ground, a young woman took her baby to the bus stop. Her mother was in the hospital and she wanted to visit her. She had moved there recently and was not yet aware the bus was not coming. In the cold with no one walking by, she slipped into hypothermia and drifted mentally. Her baby cried and cried and she was unable to rouse herself or even realize anything was wrong. Buses, after all, always seem to be taking a long time to get to your stop when you're waiting. Then a car appeared in front of her a man and a woman got out of the car and asked her what she was doing there. She explained about her mother and how they explained about the bus. They got her and the baby into the car, put a blanket over them and got them to the nearest hospital. My brother and his wife had to visit someone on QA Hill for business. They heard a baby crying when they got out of the car and presumed someone had a desperate need to get to the store for something. When they came back out about 15 to 20 minutes later though, and still heard those cries, they decided to investigate. They probably saved two lives, three, if hearing of their deaths had impacted the grandma's health. I suppose sometimes you get to be the angel. I'm a nanny and was doing some late night babysitting for the family I work for. All of the kids were in bed asleep upstairs. I double checked before turning on the TV so I settled in for the last few hours before the parents were scheduled to be home. While the youngest child, who was around three or four years old at the time, runs out of his room at full speed with his polka dot blanket in tow, across the landing and into the toy room. I, of course, call up to them and instruct the little punk to get back to bed. Silence. I call out to them again. Nothing. I finally get up and go upstairs into the toy room where I find the little light on but no child. More annoyed than anything, and thinking the kids somehow snuck back into their room without me seeing them, I march across the landing to their room. Not only are they completely asleep, but they're still tucked in the way I left them, with their polka dot blanket draped over them. Okay, that's weird, I thought. I assume my mind was playing tricks on me and went back downstairs to finish out the night. The parents got home, and the mum and I are casually chatting about the kids, and out of nowhere she asks, have you seen the kid with the polka dot blanket run across the landing yet? That's when she decided to start stopping all of the weird encounters we'd been having, and I have to say our shared mutual stories sent shivers down my spine. The one that actually scared me was when we discovered that the kids had complained of both of us hearing a heavy voice telling them to wake up while sleeping at night. 
This summer, I decided to pick up some graveyard shifts at my current full-time job, simply because it pays more, and I am a university student drowning in student debt. About two weeks ago, on the rare occasion that I get to sleep during the time the sun is down, at 3.30 to 4 a.m., I was suddenly awoken by a loud sound. Me being half asleep, I honestly didn't know what the sound was exactly. So I just chopped it up to being one of my neighbors dropping something, because I live in an apartment with very thin walls. So I was just trying to go back to sleep. After about 10 minutes of laying there with my eye closed, I hear the sound again. But this time I'm pretty much awake, so I recognize what the sound is immediately. Someone was knocking on my window. For context, I'm a single female living alone in a basement suite, so my windows are basically level with the sidewalk. Anyway, obviously I'm freaked out. I don't know what the heck to do. I don't want to move and make any loud noises so they don't know I'm home, and I'm just frozen laying in this bed. Then I hear the knocking again. I instantly bolt up as my fight or flight kicks in and run to the front door which has my keys with my pepper spray on it. The keys clink together and make a noticeable noise and the knocking starts to get more intense and loud. This is when I realize the window with the screen by my bed is almost all the way open because my cats like to sit on the edge and I forgot to close and lock it. I start to freak out, already having major anxiety. I search for my phone in case I need to ring the police. Me being clumsy and shaky, I drop my phone on the ground, and whoever is at my window proceeds to what sounds like slide either their fingernails or a sharp object down the screen. I realize that this person's intentions are to either come in or scare me, so like an idiot and not thinking, I run to the window as quickly as I can and slam it shut and lock it while avoiding looking outside at whatever it was. The knocking stops and I wait about half hour without hearing any knocking. I lay back down and go right back to sleep. The next morning, I honestly couldn't believe that it even happened to me. I start to think maybe it was a dream, so I go outside and investigate, and I see an empty beer bottle and a ripped up blanket. I text my only friend that knows where I live and ask them if they were messing with me. They say no, which I figured, because they don't drive and live quite far away and the buses around my house stopped running well before 3 a.m. So I called my landlord and told him what happened, and he obviously said to ignore it, and that this happened before, which was creepy. I obviously recognize now I should have done a lot of things differently and called the police right away. It hasn't happened since. Nevertheless, it's still terrifying, but I can't afford to move again. I find that the thing with paranormal experiences is that you've got to live it to believe it. That's what happened to me. I had this experience in 2016 when I visited Mel, my cousin's home. I was dropping off her mum at home. Since it was a long drive and it started getting dark, they asked me to stay over. The next morning I wake up late and Mel served us breakfast and told me her mum and she were going to the local market and her husband has gone to attend an emergency work. She told me to lock the doors, so I locked the doors and turned on the heater and went to grab some towels in the guest room. When I came back, the switch was turned off. I thought it was faulty switches, which is the only logical explanation when you have no belief in the paranormal. So I switched it on again and entered the shower and locked the door. Halfway through the shower, I heard something and it was like someone knocking on the bathroom doors from the outside and it freaked me out good and proper. I tried to open the doors and it was locked from the outside. So I started banging and shouting that I have a phone and that I will call the cops if they don't leave. A few seconds later, the door just opened itself with no lock sound and I rushed out to check the house for intruders. All the doors and windows were closed, except the front main window which had crossbars, so there's no way someone could have entered through that except for a cat. I came to the conclusion that the door could have been stuck, so I let it pass despite the fact I heard someone locking it from the outside. Twenty minutes later, Mel and her mum returned and told me to stay over because it's the weekend and she was planning to cook ribs. 
So I stayed over. In the evening around 3.30, Jeff came home. Later, we were sitting in the patio and discussing about random stuff. Mel went to check on the ribs, and I heard her voice calling, Mum. So I turned right to her mum and saw Mel sitting beside her mum. And I was still hearing Mel's voice clearly from inside the house. For a moment, I was completely frozen. I panicked and said, Do you hear that? Jeff just replied, Don't acknowledge it. It'll stop on its own. I was totally freaked out. What the hell was going on? Mel said they sometimes hear voices or paranormal activity happening around the house, but it didn't occur frequently. I was like, the hell are you for real? You're telling me something unexplainable is happening around you and you're okay with that. Jeff told me there was around 12 to 15 bodies found in the lake during the late 90s before they moved in. The lake is right behind the house, about 30 meters away. And the previous owner of the house was a priest who was involved in exorcism activities which they came to know later. Mel's in-laws brought the property in 2003 without any knowledge of it. Mel and Jeff moved in around 2009 after refurbishment. Jeff said they'd sometimes see a small girl in a white frock giggling and running in the house, and he assured me nothing harmful has ever happened to them in all these years. The moment you find something beyond your understanding is happening around you, it will completely mess you up. I was around 21 at the time, and ever since that incident, I had a feeling of someone following me in the dark, or someone constantly watching me. I had to take medication and do mental exercise for three years, and tried to keep myself around friends and family at all times. This happened less than a month ago. I am a petite female in my 20s. I'm currently living in Mexico to escape life a little after postgrad in a city that is not known as a dangerous place. A lot of foreigners live here, and I haven't heard any safety concerns. I'm living with my cousin who works from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. The houses are in a pretty good area with a school, nice hotel, and Starbucks within walking distance, just to give you an idea of how unexpected this was. This incident happened while my aunt was visiting us from Mexico City. She stayed home all day with me while I usually studied or watched Netflix. On this day, I was planning to have a chill day since I had woken up at around 11.30 a.m. I was watching something on my computer when I started to hear some loud pounding, like someone was working on something with a hammer. This was around midday. I thought my aunt had let some repairman in to do some work. I was under the assumption my aunt was still in the house so I wasn't too worried and continued to watch my show. The hard noise stopped, and I heard two male voices talking casually. This made me feel more confident that they were there to fix something. I get up from bed to fetch my phone, as I don't have any service planned down here, to message my aunt on Facebook to see what was going on. I didn't get a reply from her, so I just took it as she was busy and go back to lying in bed to not think of anything of the noises. Five minutes later, I hear footsteps coming up the stairs. Take in mind I'm lying in bed with my back to the door. When the door opens and I see a man, he was a pretty normal looking guy with facial hair and dressed rather cleanly. Like if you saw him in public, you wouldn't think anything negative about him. As soon as he saw me, he shut my door and went downstairs. Then I heard another huge noise that I later realized was him slamming the front door shut. My room is first room directly above the stairs, so my first thought was that this repairman accidentally opened my door. I thought he was trying to get access to our patio. I was a little confused, but again didn't think anything of the situation. I slowly walk downstairs calling my aunt's name, but I get no response. As soon as I make it down the stairs, I hear my aunt in a panicked voice saying, they just robbed us. They took the TV. She forgot to lock the first iron door of the house, which made it easy for them to break into the second door. She said that when she was walking by from the store, she noticed someone by the house. She asked him what he wanted, and he said he was looking for a teacher. Then he got into a car with the other man and left. She didn't notice the TV in their car or anything suspicious until she got to the house. She mentioned that someone had rang the doorbell before she left to go to the store when she went to check no one was there. 
She believes they've been watching her and my cousin, so when they opened the bedroom door they were caught off guard and dipped. It's really frightening to think what could have happened if they didn't get scared off by seeing me. The cops came and were then telling me that they often kidnap girls or rape them. I know I got lucky. I was babysitting my little brother. I was 16 and he was four, and he would talk and fall asleep. He had quite a few imaginary friends that he would sometimes tell goodnight before he went to sleep. One night he was talking, and unlike normal I heard something in the background of the baby monitor, and went up to see if one of his toys had come on. When I get there nothing was out of the ordinary, and he told me he was talking to the old lady. I didn't think anything of it because, like I said, he has an active imagination. Fast forward a few months and we're looking through some old family photo albums, and he points to a picture and says, that's the old lady that tells me goodnight. It was my great-grandmother, who died when I was five. This is something that has been happening for years in my family. It all started many years ago in maybe 2011 when me, my mum and my brother were outside shoveling snow. We're all focused on what we're doing because we wanted to finish quickly before dad got home. So we're all in the driveway when suddenly a blue light anomaly appears. The light came from behind me. It did not cast my shadow, none at all for that matter. It was pitch black outside in February and there were no nearby street lights. The only light source came from the spotlights from our house which stood no further than 20 meters, and the spotlights were not blue and could not shine very brightly. They also were in front of me and pointed to the ground. My first reaction was to look behind me and there was nothing. All I see is snow falling in the black sky. I look at my mum and she's already looking at me like, did you see that? My brother at this point turns around and says, I saw it too. We tried to figure out what created the blue light. We listened for cars and watched for headlights, but you couldn't hear any vehicle or helicopter. We speculated about police looking for someone with a chopper. Our neighbours weren't home. We live in the woods, and rarely are other people seen in this neighbourhood that don't live here. What gives me the goosebumps is the light just appeared in an instant and was gone. We had just enough time to react and then it vanished. To this day, it's the only time in my life I can't come up with an explanation. I was 13 when the light appeared for the first time. I'm 21 now, and it's been with me growing up. Every now and then at the corner of my eye when it's dark, a blue light will appear somewhere, but it's not often. It just comes and goes. It basically flickers to life and goes away. And I know I'm not imagining it, because someone else saw it too. My mum and brother also experience it from time to time. I certainly believe in the paranormal to some extent because of it, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on what this phantom light that appeared in the snow could be. When my wife and I were house hunting, we went to a house that was in a pretty busy part of town, but sort of tucked back and out of the way of the main road. The outside was nice, big property, beautiful trees, but the backyard backed up to the main road, so you could hear the traffic. The owners had already vacated for the most part, other than staged furniture for showing. The upstairs was meh, old carpets, outdated wallpaper, ancient kitchen. We weren't impressed, but we kept moving through knowing we could talk down the price based on what we saw. The last thing we had to see was the basement, which you got to through the back of the kitchen. When I got to the top of the steps, I felt something. Maybe it was spidey sense, I don't know. I'm not really a sensing thing kind of person. My wife is very open to the supernatural and paranormal, and she felt the same thing. I stood on the top step and just felt this weird feeling. The feeling is hard to describe, but it legit made me stop in place. It was a feeling I've never had since. It was like I was walking into a dense invisible fog that you could feel around you. The hairs on my arms stood up and I just felt everything in my body saying, 
something is not right down here. But we walked down the steps, and it only got heavier as we went. When I got to the bottom of the steps, it felt like I was wrapped in a heavy, weighted vest. I'm walking through sand. I looked at my wife and mouthed, Do you feel that? and the look on her face was one of just pure dread. She was pale white, and she was obviously feeling the same thing. She stayed at the bottom of the stairs and went, I'm going back up. I don't think we needed to see anything else. Let's go. Before turning around and going upstairs, the realtor wanted to keep looking, so I moved through with her thinking we'd be quick. We opened a door and saw where the washer and dryers were, looked at the full bathroom, the sliding glass door, out to the backyard, and then she goes, I have no idea what this door is, and opened it. It was a flush panel, heavy metal door and frame that were painted to match the wall. We both thought maybe it was a fire safe, since it had such a heavy door and there were multiple locks on the outside. I mean, heavy locks. We opened it, and the room inside was maybe five foot by five foot, and completely made of poured concrete, but it didn't look professionally done to me. It looked sort of sloppy, and not quite smoothed out properly like a professional installation. It had four metal support poles in each corner of the room, about three inches from the walls, and they had clearly been recently painted white. The concrete floor and ceiling were painted grey, and there was a new metal drain covering that was in the dead centre of the room. The walls. I swear to God those walls looked like they had been filled with wall putty. Like they were covering holes. But they weren't hole marks. Like they threw a glob on there and then smoothed it out over. It was long drawn out patches. The first thought was, that looks like the scratch marks had been covered up. I looked at the walls and the poles and you could clearly see there had been something rubbing against the poles, like the metal had scratched in the pole themselves. The feeling I had when I looked in that room made me sick to my stomach, like some kind of evil stuff went on in there. If I had just seen a picture of the room, I wouldn't have thought anything about it. But being there in person, the way the room made you feel, it was like something was kept in there something alive that wasn't meant to be in there. I could have easily looked at the picture, even if someone pointed out and was like, maybe it's a BDSM room for those owners. But it wasn't a feeling of, this room was for mutual enjoyment, if that makes sense. I closed the door, and when it was shut, I was filled with an overwhelming sense of panic, of fear, of run, and I could feel shivers going up and down my spine. It was like something was standing right behind me, breathing down my neck. It wasn't my realtor, she was standing next to me, speculating the room could have been a makeshift fire safe. But the overall feeling and impression was that it was definitely not with good intentions. We started to leave, and we heard what sounded like a low moan, like someone was in pain, but there was nowhere for the noise to come from. We could see the entire basement from where we were at, and there was nothing. So we just went, maybe it's the wind outside, and started to move up the stairs. We made it to maybe the fourth and second stair respectively, and the door to the basement, that had previously been opened and held open by a door jam, slammed shut behind us. Like someone took the thing and used their full force to slam it closed. The realtor looked back at me and goes, I guess the air kicked on and forced it closed? I looked at her and just said, Yeah, that's probably it. And we made our way up the stairs. When my wife and I were leaving, we sat in the car for a moment and I look over at her and went, Please tell me you felt that too. She responds with, Babe, I'm so glad you couldn't see what I saw. I asked her what she saw, and she said the moment I got downstairs, there was a black thing, not a cloud or image or anything, but there was just a black transparent shadow behind me. She said the thing was huge, 
and completely dwarfed me, like it went floor to ceiling in the basement. It was pretty tall and wide, maybe two of me standing side by side. She said when she saw it, she froze, and that's why she tried to get me to go upstairs with her. It was something not friendly, she said, and was scared it was going to try and harm me, if it could. That whole experience changed my views on the paranormal forever. This only happened to me once, but left an impression on me. My father and his brother Gary were lifelong dairy farmers in central Wisconsin. We lived close by and labor was traded during harvest. As I got older, he would send me saying, you have to go help at Gary's today. I grew up and took over the farm and cousin Mike took over for his father Gary. Gary died about 15 years ago. Mike sold the dairy herd and found other employment and I rented his land. My father passed away in 2013. In 2014, I sold the dairy herd. It was an October night in Wisconsin. My cousin Mike started a fire in the wood-fired furnace in the basement and went to bed. His sister had just gotten out of a bad relationship and was living there too. She arrived home from her job at midnight, added some wood to the furnace and went to bed too. Transitioning over to all crops, in the fall of 2015, I was driving around the state, looking at used equipment. What I told everyone is this, passing through the nearest large town, about 25 miles away, I decided to stop and get a meal. Seeing a movie playing that I wanted to see, I stopped to see it, then stopped at a local bar and had a few soft drinks before returning home. Passing by his place on the way home at 3 a.m., I saw flames coming out of the chimney and smoke coming from outside the basement door. I dialed 911 and ran in yelling for them to get up, but there was very little smoke in the stairs of the house. Mike and I went downstairs and found an area about three square feet above the furnace on fire. We put it out with a fire extinguisher and water. The fire department arrived to put out the chimney fire. There was very little smoke damage to the house and minimal repairs, but a few more minutes and the fire would have burnt up into the kitchen. The truth is, I got home about 10.30 p.m. and went to bed. Sometime a little before 3 a.m., my father wearing his bib overalls, something he never wore after retirement, opened my room door, turned on the light and said, get up, you have to go and help out at Gary's. I remember saying, in the morning. He then put on his most authoritative voice and said, no, right now. I sat up bolt upright in bed. My room door was open, the light was on, and the hallway light was on. I tried to brush it off as my imagination, but I knew I had closed the door and turned off the lights, knowing with the adrenaline rush and doubts that I would not get back to sleep. I decided to dress and check on Mike's place, and that is when I saw the fire and smoke. Like I said, I've never told anyone the truth from the fear that no one would have believed me. Just a little thing to add. My father actually died in this very house. I used to babysit two small kids, three and six at the time, and would occasionally put them to bed. The parents told me the younger one was afraid of the dark and would probably ask me to lay in bed with him until he fell asleep. I put the six-year-old to bed in her room and go to lay down with the little boy. About half an hour later, he'd fallen asleep and I was ready to sneak out of the room when I heard grunting and rapid flopping noises from the other kid's room. It sounded like she was having a seizure. I rushed over to find that she was flinging her arms around on the bed like a rag doll. She looked possessed. Apparently she did this almost every night because she didn't want to go to bed. Her parents didn't warn me of that before going out for the evening, and it was terrifying. A few years ago, my parents and I had moved out to the Maritimes. My parents were retiring, and I was done with high school. Our house is situated at the very center of, and I mean literally the center of a village. There are 20 people in this place at most. The house is 300 feet from the road and has forests surrounding it, except the front, which are fields that border the driveway. 
The year we moved in, I ended up moving away to Ottawa for school. The same year I went back home for Christmas between semesters. I'm your typical night owl, and my parents hate it. They were bugging me about sleeping in so much because they hadn't seen me in months, and I was sleeping away all our time together. That night I stayed up until sunrise, hoping to fix my sleep cycle. It was about 5.45am when the dog woke up and came into my room. She rested her head on my lap, and so I knew she wanted out. I went downstairs, made myself a tea, and then put a coat on. For whatever reason, that winter, it didn't snow much. And this particular day, it had snowed around 2am. I remember because I went to the bathroom and got excited when I saw it falling. I put my coat on and headed out with my dog. Usually, she bolts out the door, she's insane, and does laps around the house at full gallop. But this day, she didn't. Instead, she put her nose to the ground and trotted around the house. I thought it was weird, so I followed her. And that was when I noticed the footsteps. My parents' property has three buildings on it, a two-door garage, a workshop, and the house itself. The driveway runs from the road and sort of pulls, connecting all three buildings, and it makes an L shape. The snow that had fallen was only two centimetres or so, and so I noticed running from the forest from the bottom right of the L behind the house a set of footprints, and I was extremely curious, so I followed them. They literally came out the forest and ran around behind my house, where they stopped at a window. I lined my feet up and found myself looking in the window. Then the prints turned 90 degrees and vanished into the forest. That's when I realised... The snow had fallen around 2 a.m., so whoever had left the prints must have come after that. And while I assume most of the world is dark between 2 and 5.45 a.m., so either the guy was wandering the woods at night, or they had wandered up when the sun came up, also known as the last 40 minutes or so. So I shouted for my dog and we hustled inside. I told my dad, and he told me he left the prints which is BS because I was up all night and heard him snoring. Thanks for trying to calm my nerves anyway though, Dad. I never met my grandfather from my mother's side. He died two months after my older brother was born. When I was five years old, my mother, my brother and I were living at my grandma's house where my grandfather had a small studio. The studio was always locked because when he was young, he hunted deer and his rifles were stored in the studio inside a vault. My grandmother kept the key to the studio at all times. There was this day when my grandpa was away on a trip, and my brother and I were at home with my mum, but she was on the other side of the house while we were playing upstairs. We decided to go to the studio, so we knocked on the door, and an old man opened for us. He was smoking a pipe while writing something, and we talked about the many curious objects in there. My mother went to check on us when she heard noises coming from the studio. The door was locked. She managed to get us out through one of the windows that faced the stairs, and once we were outside, I asked her who was the old man smoking and writing in the studio. Her face turned white, but she was very excited. She answered that he may have been my grandpa. To this day, almost 20 years have passed, and me and my brother vividly remember this moment. Sometimes we talk about it in family reunions. This is particularly special to me because it was the way I met my grandpa. My family moved into this house a few months ago and my mum and I both experienced a lot of activity moving in. A few weeks ago I was playing piano in my room, which is the basement, and I get really frustrated while learning songs because I couldn't hit this one note, so I decided to take a break. When I was walking back to the piano, it played a key very loudly by itself. However, what really freaked me out was that it was the key that I was having trouble hitting. I immediately got full body shivers and felt extremely flushed and lightheaded. So I went up to my parents' room to tell them. My mum said she heard it play by itself while putting things in storage. But she had heard more than one key play. 
also. My mom was taking live photos in the basement because she takes photos and she feels something in there. All the photos turned out to be normal except two. In the first one, you can hear a deep voice say, they're watching. And the photo immediately after shows five large orbs in different places of the room. It's so crazy to me how the image coincides perfectly with what was said right before it. This house has been saged multiple times, but things keep happening. I don't know if I should just try and get more evidence or leave it alone to avoid stirring up something bad. I also always see shadows moving, but never feel like I should necessarily be afraid. As a kid, I shared a room with my brother. Our room was designed such that our closet was built into a wall that was extended inwards towards the room. Now, the bathroom was on one side of the wall and the foot of my bed was on the other. I never went to the bathroom at night because I once saw a woman in white, dirty clothes with a lot of stains and long hair and burnt skin who did nothing but stand there. Even as a kid, I thought it was just me being afraid of the dark and my mind playing tricks on me. I could never see the corner where the bathroom was without getting up because of the wall in between. And I used to stay in my bed and just hold my bladder for years as I was too scared to get up and peer over the corner. About 10 plus years later, I'm sitting in my new home using my cell phone and I hear my brother tell my mum, Mum, as a kid, I used to think our house was haunted because I thought I kept seeing this woman with burnt skin, long hair and white clothes with a lot of stains standing near our bathroom door. It must have just been a recurring nightmare. I live alone, have done for a few years. This story takes place two years ago, before the start of the pandemic. It was just an average Saturday night. It was 1 a.m. and I was up late, gaming in the basement. I'd set up my basement for a gamer's paradise. I had all the old consoles, controllers, memory cards, everything you can think of. And it would be customary that every other Saturday, I would have my friends over for some huge and epic gaming nights. This Saturday, however, was one without company. I was downstairs, headphones in, and numbing my brain with excessive gameplay. When all of a sudden, I finished a level and the music stopped briefly on the loading screen. That's when I heard a faint smack upstairs. Immediately I removed my headphones and listened more attentively. A second smack. Something or someone was at my door. I looked at my watch. It was really late, far too late for anyone to be here. I tentatively started to climb the stairs wary that it could be something horrible waiting for me, nonetheless made my way up. An important note is that the basement door opens inwards. Therefore, as I started to pull it open, I slowly peeked my head through, assuming that if anyone were looking in, they wouldn't be able to see me. As from any window on the upstairs landing, it would be fairly clear if the door were open the other way. I peek my head through and instantly see through the window and illuminated by the orange street light, a few people standing at my door. They had what appeared to be a crowbar and were trying to pry my door open. Now, I live in a relatively safe area and had always just locked my door out of habit, but now, there was someone trying to break in. My door wasn't particularly strong and my locks weren't that great. I knew that it was just a matter of time. I slowly closed the door and locked the basement door from the inside. The basement door lock, in fact, was one I had installed as a prank against some friends. I made my way downstairs, put my cell phone near the window and started dialing 911. When the operator came on, 
I frantically told her that there were men breaking into my house and that they had crowbars. She didn't miss a beat and told me that she would be dispatching someone very soon indeed. She stayed with me on the line all the while I waited in absolute agony fearing that the men were going to come closer, maybe break down my door in any second. I was absolutely petrified. I stood there, next to the window, trying to hear what the operator was saying, her words of comfort keeping me sane, as the beautiful sound of police sirens permeated the night. I heard an absolutely colossal scuffle from upstairs. And then the police exiting the vehicle and gave chase. At the end of it, only a few things were stolen. They managed to catch a few of the criminals, but I didn't ever retrieve all of my items. The real loss here is my sense of security. If anyone's experienced a break-in, perhaps they feel the same thing. I just feel unsafe. I've had extra locks put on my doors even latches put on my windows, but now I just feel vulnerable. I have security cameras outside my home and bought a specialist TV which I turn on almost every night just to watch the outside of my home. It's getting to be a bit excessive, I know, but it's the only way I sleep at night. And sometimes I still don't feel safe in my own home. They robbed me of that feeling of safety, and that's something I can never forgive them for. This is a story my dad shared with me when he worked as a trucker. It always haunts him, and he doesn't like to share it often, but here it is. This must have happened at least 50 years ago. He was a truck driver and was doing a big shipment up to somewhere in the north of the country. I can't remember where. He told me that just as he was finishing his trip, it started to snow. It was coming down light and there was no need for grit or anything like that. When he was nearly reaching his destination, he noticed a homeless man on the side of the road. He was there wrapped in a blanket, cup in hand, asking for change. Obviously driving a vehicle, there was no way for my dad to stop, but he registered the man and carried on driving. He got to his destination, unloaded, and had a few hours left, so he thought he'd start making his way back and would stop at a rest stop in order to get some sleep before finishing the journey and going home. On his way back, the snow is starting to get deep and the temperature plummeting. He's driving really slow and decides to pull up early and get a rest at a far closer rest stop not doing anywhere near the distance he wanted to achieve, but there wasn't much he could do about it now. Right as he pulls in, he tucks up and goes to sleep. The next morning, the snow hasn't really stopped. It's pretty bad, and he wonders if the roads are clear. He looks over and sees that cars are circulating, albeit very slowly. So he starts making his way, going as slow as he can, and makes his way out of the rest stop. The way he has to take back goes through a small village, which is, coincidentally, the place where he saw the guy asking for change. Right as he's going through the village, he notices a small crowd of people gathered around someone. Obviously, being at an elevation, he sees right away that it's the homeless person he saw yesterday and wonders why they're all giving him stuff. Maybe they want to give him blankets. But when he takes a better look, he sees that the man had stayed out all night and appears to have frozen in the night. They were prodding him and he was not responding in any way. My dad says that he remembers the look in the eyes of the man, glazed over and gone from this world. After stopping for a second to see the man like that, he carried on driving. He knew where the man had gone no one around him could be help for him anymore, and he carried on with the journey. He never does like talking about it, and he always feels bad for not helping that poor soul. He said that there was more than enough room and that he could have saved someone, but over the years we've had to convince him not to live with the guilt. 
who would have known that would have happened in the end. This happened in February of last year. We have a cottage about 45 minutes away from my parents' main home. It's not too far from Huntsville slash Masoka, Ontario, if anyone wants a visual. The thing is, it's completely unfinished. The basement has no proper flooring and has a slight water leak now and then, especially now. So there are plenty of fans and dehumidifiers running. As a result, one of us needs to check on the place at least once every two to three weeks to empty the dehumidifier in the basement and make sure everything's right. To describe the house layout a bit, the entrance to the basement is directly in front of the main entrance. It's a long, skinny staircase down with a low roof, so you need to crouch on the way down. There is one crappy light bulb in the ceiling, so it's always very dark down there. There's one big room, then two hallways branching off. One hallway leads to a bedroom, and the other leads to not only a second bedroom, but also a washroom, all of which are completely unfinished and without lighting. The second hallway is much longer, and the rooms are just way off in the back corner of the basement and are completely dark. In other words, it's creepy looking. So let's take you to the day it happened. My mum and I are heading up there to empty the dehumidifier, have some lunch and clean out some junk, as we're slowly gutting the place. It had been nearly three weeks since we checked up on the place at this point. We stopped at a McDonald's beforehand and each got a fillish of fish combo. First time trying one was actually not that bad. We get into the place and put our food on the table, then turn the heat on. The first thing we do is run downstairs to turn the water on and check the dehumidifier. After turning on the water, we head over to the dehumidifier and notice that there's hardly any water in it. It looks like it's only been running for a few days. There's still the regular amount of moisture on the ground, but it was strangely empty. My mum and I head upstairs and she grabs her phone to text my dad and ask if he had stopped by to empty it recently. He said he had not. We were both puzzled as to why it looked so empty, but never considered there was something else afoot. After heating up our food, we both sit down at the table and turn on the TV. About five minutes into our meal, we hear a massive bang downstairs, almost as if someone stubbed their toe really badly on a cupboard or something. We instantly jump and looked at one another with a freaked out look on our faces. The TV is still playing rather quietly. We then hear the worst thing, a small grunt coming from downstairs. It was unmistakably a human vocal sound. Was that a person? My mum whispers, and I nod. It was freaky. I wasn't really taking it very seriously for some reason. Looking back, it was pretty serious. They could have been dangerous. I told her to grab a jacket and that we should leave and call the police. So we gathered our things and I grabbed the kitchen knife on the way out. If you recall, the entrance to the basement is directly across from the main entrance to the house. So I had to make this peek around the corner and was fully expecting to see a person on the dark staircase. But luckily for me, it was just a series of stairs down into the dark abyss. Once we're out front, we jump in my car and she calls the cops immediately. Within three minutes, four cruisers show up and five cops get out. We told them what had happened, and they headed down the driveway. They were in the house for about ten minutes before the door opened. A few cops walked out and boom. The third cop brought out a short, chubby guy with long black hair and pop bottle glasses. They brought him out handcuffed on the front steps, and another cop had a bag that looked like his belongings. We were in our car which was up the street a bit and facing away from the entrance of the cottage. But my mum turned away as soon as he was brought up the driveway. She didn't want to get a good look at him, as the whole situation was quite unsettling for her. They loaded him in the back of one of the cruisers and took him away. One cop came over and spoke with my mum for a bit about the situation. Ultimately, 
my parents had decided not to press charges against the guy. He was just sleeping on the cold cement ground with a small roll-out mattress, even though there was a proper bed upstairs. This just made us think he'd been down there in the back hallway in the unfinished bedroom for a while. We probably walked downstairs to empty the dehumidifier and turn on and off the hot water a number of times and he was 15 feet away in one of those bedrooms. He probably wasn't a bad person and I'm thankful that at least he decided to empty the dehumidifier. Hopefully, he lived in there for most of the colder months this past winter. We were just lucky he didn't turn out to be one of the crazy squatters. I was in a minor car accident, T-boned at an intersection. About a hundred meters before I hit the intersection, I felt a hand on my shoulder and a male tell me to slow down. I was already a few kilometers under the speed limit, doing 55 in a 60, and I was in the car with my then three and a half year old daughter on the passenger side in the rear and would not have been able to touch me through her restraint. The other car hit me at high speed in the front passenger side. If I'd have been going any faster, my daughter would have taken the impact and not survived. A few days later, my very healthy and uninjured daughter was babbling in her bedroom. I went to check on her, and she told me she was just talking to Grandpa Kay. I asked where he was, and she pointed to the corner of the room. I figured it was just her imagination and walked away. About a week after that, she was at my mum's house and said, Hey, Grandma, Sonny says to say he's sorry he left, but he's looking after Mum for you. Grandpa Kay is my mum's dad. He died before I was born, and Mum never really mentioned him or her mum, also dead before I was born. When I was growing up, Grandpa Kay's nickname was Sonny. I didn't even know that. I was at a friend's house one night, and she was putting her little boy to bed. Her baby monitor had a camera built in and was installed at the foot of the crib. She also had one of those mattress sensors in the crib. Well, we're sitting down watching a movie and the receiver for the monitor is on the coffee table in front of us. The sound sensor spikes and the screen goes white. She picks it up and all you can make out on the screen is an eerie face. We go running to the room to see the kid is sound asleep. We look around and we don't see anything strange, so we go back to the movie. About ten minutes later, the same thing happens. I get up quickly and sneak into his room, while she stays on the couch. I catch the kid standing up in his crib, with his face right up against the monitor. He's smiling like crazy and giggling. He looks over at me and quickly lays down and acts like he's asleep. I let her know what's up and she laughs it off. A few nights later, she tells me the same thing happened to the monitor, but that this time, the boy was sitting down on the couch next to her. This started two years ago. I dropped out of school. I was at home every day, suffering from depression and anxiety. And since both of my parents were, I was alone in my house a lot of the time. So on one day, I'm alone and chilling as usual, watching Netflix and eating some snacks in my room. When I hear the phone ring, I never answer it, even if I'm home alone because of my anxiety. So I just ignored it, even if the person was really persistent. Then a few seconds later, I heard noises in the hall of my residence. I live on the ground floor. So when someone makes a noise, I hear it and I just assumed it was the neighbors. But a few seconds later, I heard someone ringing and knocking on the door brutally. With my anxiety issues, I started to feel anxious and grab a knife in case this person was trying to break into my house and was then met with silence. But when I thought it was all over, I heard someone who was literally beating at the kitchen window so hard that my window opened. At this point, I was hiding in the hallway with a knife, so I got to see the man's face when he opened the window and looked into the kitchen to see if anyone was there. I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. But when I discreetly looked at the man's face, it was a disturbing sight. He was really chill, cold, and relaxed looking. He looked into the kitchen one last time and just left. 
I knew there was something wrong with this guy. But I was so scared that I just called my aunt to pick me up, because I really didn't want to spend more time at home after what had just happened. So I was waiting, still holding my knife, anxiety poisoning me, until she arrived. Days after the incident, I hadn't seen the guy since. That was two years ago now. But yesterday, my dad told me something he had never said before because he didn't want it to flare up my anxiety. Two sisters who lived in my neighborhood saw a guy hanging around my house for a few days, especially around my bedroom window, as my window sits just in front of the residential parking lot. And the guy was hiding behind cars and watching me through windows. I had no clue what was going on. One day, one of the sisters took a photo of the guy, so he knew he had been found. The girl who took the picture told my dad about it, and my dad was watching to see if the guy was still at our place, but never saw him again. And since then, no one saw him. I don't know if his first move was knocking and ringing to see if there was anyone home. I don't know if he figured it was me or not. I think his second move was to stalk and hang around my window. But when one of the sisters took a photo of him, he knew he was screwed. That's why when my dad was watching if the guy was still around, he never showed. He knew that if he went through with his foul plan, that he'd be screwed. But what would have happened if nobody had seen him? If no one took a picture? I really wonder what his intentions were and how dark they truly are. This happened to me almost 20 years ago, when my boyfriend wanted to propose in the most romantic way possible at the time. He wanted to propose to me in a beautiful field of snow while camping. Romantic, right? Well, that's exactly what he tried to do, but it didn't quite work out. And you're about to find out why. You see, I was never really into the idea of snow camping. I liked camping. We went camping a lot. We were both very outdoorsy people. But then, when he suddenly comes out of the blue, when we hadn't been camping for months, you know, at the start of winter, that he'd like to go camping, I'm reluctant. You see, our camping gear wasn't really designed for the snow, nor had we ever been snow camping. And after reading up on it, it definitely looked like a lot more effort than it was worth. And I said to him, I wasn't really sure about it. But he pulled at my heartstrings and insisted that it was going to be so nice and romantic and that we'll have the most amazing time. And in the end, I said, OK, we could go for a weekend. According to him, that would be all we needed. And we packed up all of our regular camping stuff into the back of the car. I asked him if we needed anything special for snow camping. And he said that he had bought a special sheet to put over the tent, as well as better insulated sleeping bags. Great. You know what? I trusted his judgment, and I thought it would be fun. So we went off in the car, drove the three hours or so it took to get there, and started doing the hike to get to where our camping spot would be. It's a lot harder hiking in snow, I'm going to tell you that. And although it wasn't snowing very hard, it definitely made everything feel a lot more challenging, at least to me. Everything felt heavier, I felt slower, and generally more uncomfortable. But when we finally made it to the small clearing where we were going to be camping, he found a spot and cleared away the snow. We explored the area, and it was relatively uninteresting. It was a bit uphill, but it was a nice flat area. Now I need to point out that at this part that we were on, if you wanted to go down it would be a decline in most directions, and there was one specific part that looked especially dangerous. I don't want to say sheer as in cliff, but if you were to fall down it, you weren't going to have a good time. We prepared the area and started to have some dinner and pleasant conversation. The sun was starting to go down, and I was already feeling quite exhausted from the day. So we set up the tent, put the sleeping bags in, and just start winding down. We're talking for a little while, and he tells me how he has a big surprise for me tomorrow. 
We'd already been together for a while at this point, and I'm gonna be honest, I was expecting my ring. I was really hoping this is what he'd meant. As a little funny story, he'd actually got down at one point a few months before to tie up his shoe, and I jumped up in glee before he could do anything and said, oh my god, yes, and he said, I was just tying up my shoe. And I felt like the biggest shoe in the world. But that isn't part of the story, really. I was just expectant. So I went to bed all gleeful and happy, thinking that tomorrow was going to be the day. About time, too. And one thing about me is that I sleep like a log. A dead log. That's decayed in a swamp for years. Seriously, when I'm asleep, there's nothing that will wake me. Not even my alarm clock. So I pass out. And that's all I know. Just as the sun is starting to come up, I turn over to talk to my boyfriend and give him a hug. But he's not there. Weird, I thought. But then, something pings the back of my mind. This isn't right. Something didn't feel right. I wasn't entirely sure what. But instantly, something's telling me that this can't be right. So I groggily and begrudgingly get up because I really wanted to stay asleep. I rub my eyes, slip on my boots and look around. I start shouting my boyfriend's name, asking if he's alright, but I get no reply. And then I hear this faint whimper coming from nearby. You remember the part of the hill that I told you was quite steep to fall down? Well, what did he go and do? He decided to pee, get up and pee, over this particular part. He could have peed in any other part, but he chose to do it here. And uh, he slipped on the snow, and he hurt himself. He hit a tree. He'd been there for about, I don't know, 10 minutes or something, according to him. He didn't really recall, but he was already getting pretty cold and shivery. I was nervous about hypothermia. And even though it was snowing and there was snow on the ground, I don't think it was super cold, but in any case, our trip got cancelled pretty quickly. He was insistent that we unpack the tent, even though he was already shivering, and clearly the fall had hurt him. So we slowly limp back down, and after about four hours make it to the car. I feed him both our energy bars that we had reserved for this day, and that we were going to go to the hospital to get him checked out. We make it there, and apparently he did have onset of hypothermia, whatever that means, and he had some bruising and stuff, so it wasn't overly that bad. But had I not woken up, and that little sense told me to get up and check on my boyfriend, I think there's a good chance things could have got a lot worse, because like I said, when I'm asleep, I'm asleep, and I'm sure no matter how hard he screamed, I don't think I would have heard a thing. Lucky for me. He actually proposed to me one week later, which is good. My husband is fine, thankfully. When I was seven, my great-grandpa died of natural causes. Now keep in mind, I was a total slob as a child, never cleaning up after myself. I wake up one day in a half-asleep daze a few weeks after the funeral and I see my great-grandpa putting away all my clean clothes that were on the floor the night before. He says, Hey, sweetie, go back to bed. I'm just cleaning. I wake up for the second time a few hours later. I walk over to where he was standing and see all my clothes that were on the floor had been neatly put away in my dresser. I asked my mum if she had done that, and she said no, and her jaw dropped when I told her what I saw. My next spooky experience was when I was eight. My cousin died from a collision with a semi, as her car lost control on black ice. About a month or so passed, and I put in grief counselling because my young brain couldn't process such an early violent death. One morning at my grandma's again, I wake up in a half-asleep daze, and she's on her knees on the floor smiling at me. She said, When you're ready, I have the kids' table set up for some tea, okay? I don't remember if or how I reacted, but I blinked and she was gone. I didn't go back to sleep this time. The kids' table was set up with cups and pretend drinks and teapots. I asked my grandma if she did this, and she said no. This third story is more tame, but it still freaked me out. My dad died when I was 19. 
and his ashes were separated between me, my sister, and my brother. Maybe a week into having his ashes, the lights in my apartment began to flicker on stop. We tried changing the bulbs, calling maintenance to fix it, but nothing worked. I texted my sister and asked her if she had anything weird happen since receiving his ashes. She had the same problem with her lights, and she'd never experienced it in her house. But I knew it's frowned upon to contact the dead, but the flickering lights were annoying no end. I said out loud, if you're here, Dad, could you please give me any other sign that doesn't involve messing with my stuff? I then got a knock on my bedroom door at 2 a.m. I was home alone, and the security footage showed no sign of a break-in. My final story was at my mum's house. It's haunted too. We've had ghosts since we moved in when I was a kid. There are very clear footsteps coming from the upstairs all the time. And this arse of a ghost likes to slam open and shut kitchen cupboards, paranormal activity too style. Some ghosts, I guess, are just inconsiderate. I had to babysit my friend's children with a childhood friend of my own named Charlotte. The kids we were watching were one and two. It was around 7.30 at the time when the parents wanted us to put the kids to bed. So I go to the bathroom and Charlotte goes to take the family dog. I have all finished my business and I'm washing my hands when I get a huge headache. I fall forward and bang my head on the mirror. A few seconds later I'm dizzy but all right and I hear Charlotte come to the front door with the dog. As I come out of the bathroom, she asks me why I put the kids to bed by myself and says that she would have helped. I told her I didn't and got a little worried. We searched everywhere they could have conceivably gotten but couldn't find them. Last place we looked is their shared bedroom. We walk in, there they are. The two-year-old in his bed and the one-year-old in the crib, both in fresh clothes and diapers. The crib had a railing twice as tall as the two-year-old's, so we know for certain he didn't do it. The next day we came over and told their parents, then went to talk to the two-year-old and ask if he remembered what happened. Throughout the usual two-year-old babbling, he said as though he thought that I had picked them up and taken them to bed. This definitely wasn't so. I still can't explain it, and years later, it still freaks me out. I was in an antique store in the Midwest United States. The buildings are narrow in downtown, and you enter the store on the first floor. I walked to the back, then downstairs, and back to the front of the building. There was no exit, so you have just backtracked up to the first floor and out the front. The access to the second floor must have been restricted from the public or something. I walk in and there's no one there that I can see ahead of me. I make it back down, then proceed downstairs. I've been to this store several times, so I'm aware there's a TV at the base of the stairs that plays VHS movies. It's quiet for a while, aside from the audio from the TV, which I can plainly hear and discern. Rather suddenly, I hear a lady in some distress, presumably on the phone, because there wasn't anyone responding to her. Why can't you understand? I can't go on like this. Why do I deserve any of this? She's manic. This is all happening over the low volume of the TV. I felt a little uncomfortable and considered leaving. She stopped talking, so I resolved to just walk past her. She must have been about 10 feet on the left, in the next booth or two. Absolutely expecting to see a crying woman, I was confused after getting to the dead end basement where it felt like I walked in front of an AC window unit and the hairs on my arms stood on end. I didn't have time to be spooked or scared. None of it made sense. It was just very confusing. I called the owner today. She never experienced anything like this, but several other people have. She listened intently to my story and said she was very sensitive to spirits and thanked me for telling her about it. My granddad used to live in a cottage which had something in it. Cliche things would happen. The piano would play random keys at night. The decorative plates would move. The cat would hiss randomly at the same spot in the house. The strangest thing was a door between the master bedroom and the small box room, my room whenever I stayed there. For some reason, the door in between the two rooms would always be open in the morning. 
Now my granddad and grandma were quite private people and liked to have that door shut when I would stay. My granddad would always tell me off for opening it in the night, even though I swear I hadn't. So one night we talked about it, and I suggested putting something in front of the door so it couldn't open easily. Great, good idea. So my granddad took some books and stacked them in front of the door so they wouldn't open that easy, or not without making a lot of noise anyway. We said good night, and off to bed we went. The next morning the books are still standing up, but the doors open. We were obviously freaked out. The next night he did the same, books in front of the doors and off to bed. In the morning all of the books were knocked over. Some had even been put in different rooms of the house, and some were in the shed, some 50 meters away. After my grandparents had moved out, they found some records in a local church about the house. Apparently a girl had been pushed down the stairs by her mother and died. They believed this was what was causing things to happen. The husband of the couple that moved in after them had had a heart attack three weeks after moving in, after being supposedly happy and healthy. I was asked to babysit some young children of a friend of my mum's. The three boys aged four, seven and nine were already in bed when I got to the house. I was just expecting to keep an eye on the children from seven till ten so that the parents could go out for dinner. The house was old but had a pretty cosy feeling and so I'm settled up in front of the fire in the lounge and start studying for a biology exam. A new family kitten kept me company as I studied, sleeping on the couch next to me. I'm unsure what time it was, but all of a sudden the kitten jumped off the couch and went and stood next to the open door that led to the front entrance hallway. It just sat there staring upwards, and when I looked in the direction, a strange feeling came over me. It felt as if someone was staring at me. I felt sick and anxious and as if whatever was staring was unsure of me. I don't know how, but I felt as if the presence was an older woman. After a few minutes, the feeling quickly disappeared, and I felt welcome in the house again. At this time, the kitten stopped staring up and joined me on the couch. I checked on the boys who were fast asleep and went back to studying. The next day, I explained the experience to my mum, who then shared the experience with the mum of the kids I babysat. She told my mum that the house had been in her family for over a hundred years, and the most recent death in the 1980s had been her grandmother. Her son, the four-year-old, talks all the time about Nana, and how Nana visits him in his room. She did not know what he meant, until one day she was going through some old belongings, and her son pointed to a photo of her grandmother saying, that's Nana. I believe the presence I felt was the grandmother and that she was also babysitting the children on that very night. Around 1 p.m. my brother and I were at a grocery store and we bumped into one of his friends from high school. They greeted each other and made some small talk. I said hi since we were schoolmates. That night, around 8 p.m., my brother received a call that his friend, who was in a coma for 12 hours, just died. He thought he was receiving a prank call, since we had just met about seven hours earlier. What's even creepier is that two of my brother's friends interacted with him on the same day. Maybe he was trying to say farewell to his friends. I just moved to New York back in July from Mississippi and hadn't had any problems until January. So I go to a high school that's maybe 10 minutes driving away from my house, and I take the bus every day to and from school. Usually my mum will come to pick me up from the bus stop and take me home, and I usually only have to wait a minute or two. This day I was waiting for 10, so I called her a couple of times and she didn't answer. So I assumed that she fell asleep, like she does sometimes, and opted to walk home instead. I usually go in a straight line for three streets and then make a right and walk straight down from there. On this day I was wearing a tank top with a jacket on, a Batman pyjama pants and an old school style Vans. The perfect outfit for walking in the snow, right? As I'm walking straight down I see a man who is in front of me and walking the same way as me. 
So I take the right turn early, because I like to be cautious when dealing with other people on the street, especially if I'm alone. So as I'm walking down and start to make the right turn, I see that the man is now walking the opposite way he was before, and is now walking towards me, which sets off some red flags in my head. This guy is probably 5 foot 11 to 6 foot tall, wearing a black beanie, tan jacket and blue jeans, where I am a very small girl at 5 2. So I knew that if he wanted me, he could definitely have a high chance of getting exactly what he wanted. I naturally started walking faster than I already was, and turn as he probably is 10 yards away from me, and I'm walking really fast and straight down. As I'm walking for about five minutes, turning around to check to see if he's made the turn after me, and I didn't see him until the last time, so I turned around, and he made the turn, and was walking straight for me. So I started speed running while I'm also on the verge of a panic attack, and all adrenaline has kicked in, and then so does he. I stay at the same speed for a few minutes so I don't tip him off and let him know that I can see him following me. After a few minutes I see my house and just book it to my house and turn around to see him running after me. When I finally make it into my house I slam the door and begin to cry. That guy could have easily gotten to me if I hadn't have been careful and who knows what the hell he would have done to my 16 year old self. I told my mum and she was mortified. Luckily, he didn't see exactly which house I went into because the way my neighborhood is set up, the house is covered by two rows of other houses. And I'm thankful that I have not seen him since. My girlfriend and I were driving back to her parents' house when I was probably 17 or 18. We went down this one road and she screamed for me to swerve. I figured she'd seen a deer. When I turned my head, I saw a woman dressed in white pushing a white bassinet. She was also holding a boy's hand and was wearing white. They weren't in my rear view mirror. When I was young, around seven to eight years old, I was napping in my room, which I shared with my younger brothers. Our bedroom consists of only three mattresses put on top of two inch wooden paneling. My mum was afraid that if we fell in our sleep, we'd break a bone or two, and a child-sized wardrobe. There was also a floor-to-ceiling window that is strictly for decoration and cannot be opened. When I woke up from my nap, my babysitter, she is live-in, was folding our clothes. I spoke to her for a while and then went to get water. I don't remember what, but I needed to talk to her after, so I went in again, but she wasn't there. I remember thinking that it was weird. No sound of closing and opening of the door was heard in the five minutes that I left the bedroom to go get water. I proceeded to ask every person in the house if they see her. None of them did. So I went inside the room for a second time, searching. Maybe she somehow hid somewhere there. Still could not find her. So I went out again and searched the house before eventually going back to the bedroom for the third time. There she was, sitting in the bed, folding clothes like nothing had happened. I asked her where she went, and she replied, and I quote, What are you talking about? I've been here the entire time. But I was shouting at you, asking where you kept going in and out of the room, but you wouldn't answer. She thought I was pulling a prank on her, and had me reprimanded. There are still a few other instances that happened around her, which to this day, I cannot logically explain. I was 12 and staying over at a buddy of mine's house. His dad was a cop and very reclusive, so as much as I hang out at their house, I had only ever seen him a handful of times and never engaged him. We had a spot in the basement where we played Nintendo. To our left was the furnace slash workshop. His dad usually stayed upstairs but not in the living room, usually the parent's bedroom, I suppose. When I saw him standing in the furnace room at the workbench, I'll never forget, he was wearing a red flannel. I was shocked to see him look at me and grin slightly. My natural reaction was to look away, and a second or two later, when I curiously looked back at him, he was gone. I didn't think anything of it. Later on upstairs, he asks his mum where dad is, 
She said he's off at work. No, he isn't, I say. He was just downstairs at the workbench. My friend and his mum fell silent. My mum asked him what he was wearing and I replied, A red flannel. My buddy was petrified, the mother shaken. It was not until years later that I realised I had seen a ghost. Neither mum or son ever elaborated on it. Shortly afterwards we went to junior high, where I found new friends and regrettably sort of lost contact with him. This is one of my buddy's stories. We were at a brewery with some friends and our spouses and I asked him a question about his ex. Someone made a joke because I dated his ex at one point in high school. I don't regret it really, but it was a dumb decision because it did hurt our friendship at the time. Anyway, I remember sitting in the couch with her and she told me that when she was a kid, she had an imaginary friend she could legitimately see. Her name was Emily and she had very long black hair. She told me she had a friend over who claimed to be able to see paranormal things and claimed to see Emily. So while we were talking about that, I asked him if he'd ever seen Emily or heard her being spoken about. I mean, him and his ex dated for years. He took a big gulp of his sour drink. Yeah, man. I know you remember how her room was laid out and all. Well, I was staying the night at her house and I woke up and she was sitting there in the mirror brushing her hair. I'm thinking, damn, it's awfully late to be brushing your hair, but I just rolled over into the bed and as I looked, she was there sleeping next to me. I rolled back over and no one was in the mirror. That's when I realized it was Emily. In the early 1990s, I worked for a volunteer-based security group. We didn't have a radio license for real walkie-talkies yet, so we had a set of headsets that worked off some common household frequencies. These frequencies were used for child walkie-talkies, cheap cordless phones, drive-through speakers, baby monitors and such. During an outdoor distance test, I picked up some old lady's cordless phone where she was talking about gross medical stuff, but she couldn't hear us to get her to stop. And while testing a battery replacement, I picked up a two-way baby monitor in a nearby apartment. There was a baby fussing and the sound of the woman doing some dishes. I'll be right there, hon, the woman said. On a whim, I pushed talk on my headset and said with a loud demonic voice, Feed me. Then I hear the shattering of dishes. This was hilarious when I was 21, but now that I'm older, I feel a little bit bad. Sorry, stranger lady. About six months ago, my man and I were in Seattle. There was a big snowstorm that hit then, and we were in it, homeless too. My man made a call to his ex-stepbrothers pleading for help after some guy ran our car off the road. I was left with cracked ribs and ended up losing my job because I obviously couldn't work for months. We were living in that car and saving for a place. We ended up spending our savings on hotel rooms and trying to find a room to rent. No one would accept couples at all. Most just wanted younger women. So I made a shot in the dark to call my mother's friend, who I hadn't seen in 16 years. She paid for our Amtrak from Olympia to Wentachi. We couldn't reach our destination as we had cats. Amtrak had a seven hour limit on animals, so his ex stepbrother was gonna pick us up in Wentachi. Once we reached Seattle though, the snow was coming down and our train delayed. We couldn't sleep at the station, so my mama foot the bill for the cheapest hotel in the area and decided to walk as far as we could so the cab wouldn't be overly expensive. Well, St. James Street is a hill, a hell of a hill, straight up and awful for someone who's injured. We stop about halfway for a break. and This is where we see a tall, well-built man eyeing us. I immediately went on guard. I knew how he was watching us and looking at our cart. We had stolen an Amtrak cart and covered our cats with blankets and some cured them down. They looked like luggage, well kept luggage. He kept getting closer and walking on either side of us. My brain thought, these are my babies. And I told my ma'am we should make it to the next block 
and he followed us. But I was tired, and my chest ached. We had to stop. So did he. I was done at this point. He ignored my man because I'm sure he saw me in pain and thought he could intimidate me or something. And once he was within a foot of the cart he was so fixated on, I stepped up. Hello, can I help you with something? I made sure to say it very loudly to grab his attention. About five people looked at us. His eyes met mine, and I felt the challenge in his. I turned my smile into a glare and challenged him right back, and he stepped closer to me. I dare you to try, I growled. He wanted our stuff. He didn't know only cats were under the blankets. Doubt he would have believed that anyway. The man glared back at me and then looked at my man, then back at me. Walk away, I said lowly at my limit. Come hell or high water, cracked rib or not, he wasn't going to touch the cart holding my fur babies. And my man came up to my side. He's skinny, but strong. Makes me mad when we wrestle. He always wins. Thank the Lord this was enough for the guy to finally look around at the few bystanders watching the ordeal go down, and after a few more seconds just turned and began walking away. We called a cab the moment he was out of sight. This happened only about ten minutes after we'd left, and I knew he was trying to rob us. Must have looked like easy targets, and I was hurt and it showed. And the look in his eyes confirmed everything, the intent to hurt. But I honestly would have risked hurting myself further to protect my man and cats. I knew my man could handle this, but that's not who I am. Fear is felt initially, but I push it away. I can be scared after I'm safe. I would have become that guy's worst nightmare had he taken one more step. My biological dad lives in a creepy old farmhouse he renovated. I was helping him build out the office late one night. He went to the bathroom and I kept plunging away. I was on the floor and set my hammer down, and I felt something, a presence, and looked to where I thought someone would be, but there was nothing. I reach back down for my hammer, and it's out of arm's reach, maybe five feet further than where I had set it down. I hadn't moved it at all. He comes back after he's finished, and I tell him what just happened. He laughs and says, Ha! The little girl must be playing with you. Uh, little girl, what? He tells me every now and then he hears a little girl laughing, and has even seen her. She's always wearing the same pair of overalls, and she just kind of wanders around upstairs. I'm not one to believe in the paranormal, but I have no explanation other than a little ghost girl just wanted to play. These events took place when I was about 20. I'm a female, and had a steady gig babysitting these kids that I met off my well-known university coach. She gave me the gig, and I was thrilled to go over to her house and meet her kids one day. They liked me, and I got the gig. As time went by, I'd go more and more frequently to their house to babysit. I need to describe the layout so you fully understand. This was a relatively modern London home, perhaps converted at some point, and with two floors, which, for me anyway, I find relatively uncommon in London, especially for just one house. You had the ground floor, which was sort of split level. Then you had the first floor, and the second floor. It was a pretty nice place with more than enough room for the mum and her two kids. Anyway, the main thing you need to know is that the main bedroom is right above the living room. So, on to the story. I'd picked up the little girl from ballet and the boy was already home waiting for my arrival, the mother leaving minutes before, so there being very little time in between. As usual, I fed the kids, did a few activities with them before taking them upstairs and doing the whole nighttime routine thing. When they were finally in bed, I got some time to relax to myself. I was currently ploughing through a book that she had on her bookshelf and wanted to know if I could finish it before she got home, as I was on the last few pages and had been reading it every time I babysat. It was around 11 o'clock at night. The mum hadn't come home yet, and I was very entertained in my book. When I hear a creak, the house had wooden floor, 
and I distinctly hear a creak and then footsteps. Now, after babysitting in this house a number of times already, I sort of identified the footsteps, but these ones I couldn't place. They didn't sound like either children. And the odd thing is, it was coming from directly above me, i.e. the mother's bedroom. The kids' bedrooms were further away, which I found a little bit odd. Part of me hoped that one of them had snuck into the mum's room and then just got off the bed, which wasn't unusual for the little girl to do. But I would always, always hear her get out of her bed and move across the floor. The sound was unmistakable in the eerie silence. So I prick my ears up and listen, but I don't hear anything else. I wanted to call out. The temptation was right there, but I decide against it, thinking that it, if I'm wrong and I'm just imagining things, or maybe it's the house settling, then there's a good chance I'll wake the kids. So this time I decide to leave it. Give or take five or ten minutes, and I hear the noise again. This time, it sounds like someone had gotten off the bed and was walking towards the child's room. The footsteps stopped abruptly, and this time, my heart was telling me that there's no way this was the house settling. These were definite footsteps, made with intention. I knew, this time, that if someone had gotten off the bed and walked over the first time, there's no way they could have done it a second without me hearing something. A jump would have made the floor and bed sound. There is simply no way. It is impossible and unfeasible. So, I quietly made my way upstairs, and although I say quietly, the floorboard, with every step I took up those stairs, creaked. So it was almost like a death rattle walking up each and every step. I was convinced by the time I'd reached the top, the kids would be wide awake asking me what was going on, but fortunately for me, there wasn't. I get to the top of the stairs and look down the hallway. The door to the mother's room is open perfectly open, and I can see inside just fine. The girl's room is right next to her mother's and is closed. The boy's door is behind me and is also closed. I think to myself, there's no way they would have opened and closed those doors so quietly. And a cold chill goes down my back. What if it's an intruder? I tell myself. And now I get on high alert. I try and dampen my footsteps, despite the fact that each one makes a pronounced creak, almost seeming like each one louder than the last. I slowly and carefully tiptoe my way across the loud floor until I reach the mother's room and switch the light on. I examine the windows, which I admit was something I had never up until this point done before. I'd never needed to. I'd started babysitting in the summer and it was always the afternoon or evening when I came, so it was relatively cool by then anyway. And it was winter now, deep winter. No reason to open those. I noticed that they would be impossible to open from the outside, at least not without making a considerable amount of noise and damage. They had a funny little latch that could only be opened from the inside that was actually connected to the board underneath it, so I thought it was very improbable. After having a few tugs, I recognised this was definitely not a point of entry, which just left upstairs. Could have someone got in from the second floor, come down the stairs, and then and only then made the sound? It really depended if the stairs going upstairs made sounds at all. And as I made my way up the stairs to check, each and every step creaked, just as I knew it would. When I reached the top, I looked around this loft room. There wasn't much there. A few boxes and a bed and a toilet, nowhere to hide in or behind, and I looked under the bed and in the only closet in the room. Where the hell could this mystery person have come from? The sky window was closed, and again, something you could only open from the inside without making a considerable ruckus. So, resigning myself to it must have been in my imagination, I made my way downstairs, but still with goosebumps. 
a few minutes later, after I had just started resuming my breed, did I hear a noise again. The familiar creak. What sounded like footsteps again, but this time they were coming towards the stairs, and they stopped, shy of the top step. I didn't move this time. I didn't want to see. I felt like whatever this was was playing with me, and it knew it was getting on my nerves and scaring me. I closed the book and just sat there, containing the urge to wet myself in fear. Fortunately for me, the mum came back a few minutes later, and when she asked me what was wrong, I tried to explain to her about the creek, but she cut me off fast and said, oh, don't worry about that, we have a ghost. It came out so casually. I asked her if she was sure and how she knew. She said that she'd been living here for a number of years and that she always has problem with sounds and it always sounds like people are walking about. She said that her kids had even said a few times that they've seen what looks like a shadow out of their corner of their eye. And there was even one occasion when her daughter was younger when she asked who the lady singing to her at night was. That was about the final straw for me. I said thank you, got paid and left. It took a while before the lady asked me to babysit again and I really wanted to say no from fear but decided to give it one more shot. And after coming back, I never saw or heard anything ever again. But from time to time, as we chat before I leave, the mum would tell me about her experiences if anything interesting or fresh happened. My dad passed away at the ripe age of 99. My dad had always been a penny guy and would always pick them up. He lived through the Great Depression and his family had always been poor. Anyway, he never believed in wasting money. The day after his funeral, I was in my room with my son looking at some photos. A penny fell off the dresser and rolled across the floor. Not sure what knocked it off, but I jokingly told my son, well, I guess your granddaddy's letting us know that he made it. We laughed it off, but after that we began finding pennies every day. Every time one of us would pick it up, laugh and say, guess granddaddy was here today. The following year my son turned 21. He was working that day at Six Flags over Texas as a train engineer on their two antique steam locomotives. At the end of his shift he drove home and found me getting ready to go out for his birthday party dinner. He said, Mum, you know how we always joke about Granddaddy leaving those pennies? I said, sure. I just found one earlier today. He asks me to hold out my hand, and into it he puts a handful of pennies. He then said, count them, which I did. There were exactly 21 pennies. He said, I found these on the last run I made to the train today. Ghost or odd coincidence? Doesn't really matter to me but it made my son happy, and that made me feel great. Maybe my dad really was reaching out to say happy birthday to his only grandson. This happened when I was around six or seven. We were going out with the family, my mother, father, older sister. There was snow outside on that day. It had already settled four to six centimeters at least on the ground. The car windows were foggy. Here's where it starts. Everyone was almost done and ready to get into the car, but I was already done, so I pressed the car key and got in. I got into the back seat. When I looked at the window, I saw a hamper at the window in the inside of the car. First, I thought, okay, nothing special. I was six or seven, so what should I think about it? But then I looked more at it and noticed it had an extra joint. I counted them. The reason was because their fingers were extremely long. Then I saw my family coming, and for some reason thought it best to wipe the handprint off. They never saw it, and I never spoke of it. I'm coming up to 19 and it happened 10 years ago, but the more I think about it, the weirder it gets. One, it was a fresh handprint on a foggy window, on the inside of a car, and no one had got in yet. I was the first person and I checked the car and couldn't find anything or anyone. Who the hell could have done it? My mum told me this story when I was younger, 
but now refuses to talk about it. This was before I was born. My sister was a newborn at the time, and my mum stayed home for a while after maternity leave while my dad worked. She was new to Canada and eager to make friends and eventually get to know our neighbours. One had a seven-year-old girl. My mum would often visit and invite her over for ice cream to the point it became a reoccurring thing after school. Unfortunately, the kid got into an accident and passed away. Time kind of passed until one day my mum heard the door knock. She peeped through the door hole and shockingly saw the little girl. Out of panic, she kind of stumbled backwards with no words coming out of her mouth. Frozen, the little girl asks if she can come in for ice cream. My mum claims she told the little girl to go away and she wasn't real. The girl persisted, this time knocking harder on the door. The knocks got harder and harder, eventually turning into thundering smashes. The door frame was shaking and the door itself looked like it was about to split down the middle. Then suddenly everything stopped. It's dead quiet and everything is calm and motionless. That's when my mum claims she heard the most evil roaring and terrifying voice belt out from behind the door. Let me in. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope that you've all been well. Well, it's time to address the elephant in the room. I'm really sorry about the train video, <laughs> so complaints on all fronts. When I made the compilation, I actually only had train stories. I didn't realise that it had been duplicated and it really bothered me that that happened. Because I'm quite good with checks. And then when I realised I'd pasted something in, allegedly twice, I, um, well, I wasn't best pleased. Um, so I'm very sorry. I've taken the video down. Well, I've made it unlisted, so if you were watching it at the time, you could still watch it, but, you know, other than that, it's, um, it's gone. You shouldn't be able to find it. Would you like me to release the audio on SoundCloud so that everyone, I'll obviously edit it properly this time, and everyone can just hear the stories as they were intended to. Um, please let me know if there's something you'd like, and I'll go ahead and do it, if you'd like me to. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just very sorry about that. Also, I've been looking at my analytics, and it would appear that the best days for me to post are not in fact Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday, but are actually Wednesday and Sunday. And I think if I want to keep doing three videos a week, which I do like doing, I would probably post on Friday, just, you know, just so everything fits in quite neatly. Um, so I may be trialling that at some point soon. Also, in regards to having visuals, I know some of you complained that you wanted the black screen. I think there are people out there who would like the visuals. Um, maybe some of you do already. I know a lot of you do watch this for falling asleep. Um, so I'm trying to come up with a, with a compromise of having mostly darkness on screen, but also something just there. Maybe I can have rain or something. It, I just want to try something, even if it's dark, even if it's not too bright. I'd like to play around with this, so I hope that you guys have a little bit of patience while we play around, get some feedback from all of you, and um, and you can say. And I know you guys love it, and I'm really glad you love it, and I'm not saying it's going away. I'm just saying that, you know, as a creator, I like, I like making things, and it does get a bit repetitive when you just make the same thing all the time. I, I really want to start making, well, I really want to just spice things up every once in a while. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, I think that's enough babble from me. I really appreciate you guys coming today. I really hope that you've enjoyed the video. And hopefully, I'll see you on Thursday for probably a dose of Attic Stories. Until then, stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one. And uh, a huge thanks to my members and patrons, by the way, names on screen. I love you guys so much. You guys are the best. Bye. When I was a teenager, I had to study weeks before exams. So when I was home alone, I was sitting in my room, door open, so that the cat could come and go as it pleased. I was studying in silence, 
and after a while I became aware of sounds downstairs, and it sounded like someone was walking around down there. Not footsteps, but the swishing of clothing. All the windows in the house were shut, so I thought that maybe the maid had popped in for some reason. She had a key and lived across the road, so I went down to investigate, and no one was there, and the noises had stopped. I walked through the entire downstairs of our house as it wasn't very big and it didn't take very long. Eventually, I was standing at the bottom of the stairs about to walk back up to my room when I heard the same swishing sound again, but now it was upstairs. So, repeat, and I looked upstairs and no one. Again, I could hear movement downstairs. As I walked up and down all over the house multiple times, I could not find what made the noise. A few years later, my brother was the one studying at home, and the exact same thing happened to him. As a kid, I used to be pretty scared of aliens or ghosts or whatever, but I grew up in San Diego and moved to Las Vegas. I went back to visit, and the job I had at the time was at Starwood Hotels, so they had a lot of super cheap employee rates and around the world, and one of those was for the US grant in downtown San Diego and the hotel is super nice for 59 a night. And one morning, very early, I hear a seriously demonic voice, but I'm pretty groggy, my eyes are closed, somewhere between waking and sleeping, and I kind of ignore it, but then I wake up and had remembered that voice right away. Then there were some oddities that happened as I awoke, like literally articles of clothing. I had just taken off the bedside and a pillow were miraculously and by themselves in the bathroom. So it's not like, oh, I must have left them there. And how was that pillow there? It was just on the bed. So I sort of dismissed it all, but with the demonic voice in my mind. So then I go to dinner with my friends and I'm telling them all of this. When we all look up on our phones, haunted places in San Diego and the US grant shows up and reads, it's not unusual for housekeeping staff to report their cleaning supplies moved while tending to other things in different guest rooms. Some guests have claimed that they've seen the ghost of a man standing over them while they're in bed. The man is reportedly heavy set, dons a black suit, and quickly appears and then vanishes. Problems with light flickerings are frequently reported, as well as hearing random footsteps and other obscure noises. Well, Maybe it was paranormal after all. I was on my way home from a 12 day vacation, driving a pickup, pulling a fifth wheel RV. It was about 11 p.m. on a Saturday night in late July, and I was about two hours from home, trying to make it home yet that night. I was in a very rural area where there was almost no one living on about a 20 mile stretch of road. There is only one combination gas station slash tavern slash motel, and it's heavily wooded on both sides. It's a county maintained and fenced at the tree line. The shallow ditches had been mowed, and the grass was about six inches high. I only saw a couple of cars on this whole stretch. I was going about 50 because it was heavily populated with deer. I saw movement ahead, so I immediately slowed down. As I passed, I saw a young woman, tall, fit brunette, wearing a cropped top, pleated skirt and stockings, walking with traffic just off the shoulder. I immediately thought she had car trouble, though I had not passed a car that had broken down. Or perhaps it was a fight with her boyfriend. I pulled to the side of the road, hit the emergency flashes and grabbed the flashlight to check on her. When I got to the rear of the camp and no one was there, I looked around for her. There was no way she could have reached the back of the RV before I did. So she could not have been hiding there. She could not have hidden the ditches as the grass was too short, and she could not have made it all over the fence without a light. In the little time it took me to get the rear of the RV, I looked out where she'd been walking and saw no signs that the dew on the grass had been disturbed. I drove the rest of the way home with the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. I'm a skeptic paranormal investigator, and I've had a lot of experiences, most which can be rationally explained away. However, I've had two outstanding experiences, about 14 years apart. 
The first was in the year 2000. I lived in a house that was, for lack of a better term, haunted. Lots of things went on there, but it was the night I saw and heard a full-bodied apparition walk down the stairs in front of me and a friend. It got to the bathroom, turned, walked right past us and disappeared as it went into our living room. I've never seen anything like that before. It was one of those things where you have plenty of time to say to yourself, is this really happening? And in that moment, all the stories I heard seemed to culminate in this reality. I thought, oh my God, this is what they were talking about. The second was in 2014. I was at one of our regular stops called the Shanley Hotel. I've stayed there with the investigation team several times, but on Halloween night, I woke up to the sound of a woman positively sobbing on the other side of my bedroom wall. It was coming from an area that used to be a catwalk that was now sealed. It was 3.35 in the morning, and it went on for four minutes, but felt like an eternity. Of course, I couldn't sleep after that, and it wasn't over. About 45 minutes later, the activity continued, when I clearly heard a man and woman talking right in my room followed by the sound of various people stopping and running around outside my bedroom door and saying, Hey! I checked out the entire area, and there was no evidence of trickery. We knew the place inside and out, but had access to the entire building. I considered every possible way it could have been a trick, but it just didn't make sense. I think a lot of people get carried away and blow their experiences out of proportion. I've had plenty of my own that I couldn't really make a big deal about, but those two experiences have always been with me, and I think about them often. My parents split up when I was a kid, and I went to my father's new home when I was something like 15. I'm 30 now. This house had quite a story, and my father as well. I don't really know if there's an equivalent in English, but there was a... Magnestia, a healer. To be honest, I grew up with a lot of doubts about his gift, but he actually helped a lot of people. So I went along with it. He claimed several times he had the capacity to sense the souls around him. He would also talk about his guides. He was a believer, a lot more than I. I generally think most stories are interesting, but probably nonsense. Anyway, he brought the house. That was almost in ruins. He brought it from a friend of the village he was in, as we grew up in the countryside of France, in the Berry. It was a particularly renowned village, because many artists and potters lived there. It was a big business. Well, apparently the previous owner was a potter too, but an eccentric one. He made an entire wall on the house with clay pots mounted on it. I heard he was buried in this village, and he eventually killed himself in this very house. His spouse didn't want to sell it to any other potters because she thought that they were responsible for his death, so she sold it to my father. When I came in the first time, I just felt like being in an old country house without anything special. The stone floor was cold, there was a big wood stove and my father made a mezzanine in front of his bedroom. It was a house for one person with a living room mixed with the kitchen, a bathroom on the east and his waiting room or consultation room for his healing sessions on the west, and just the bedroom upstairs with the mezzanine that I would sleep in. We spent a few hours in the living room first. I was walking a bit, and at some point, I thought I saw something by the window. It was just in the corner of my eye, but I was sure I saw something. I went to see what it was, and my father just said, Oh, you saw him too? Then he told me about the guy and his story. He told me several other experiences. One especially stuck with me. When he was taking the measures to install the new windows, he heard something telling him, tu t'es trompé, as in, you made a mistake. He quickly dismissed it and thought that it had just been in his head. Then he went to order his windows and indeed there was a mistake. He had other experiences like things falling, voices, or generally the feeling that he wasn't alone, but I guess it's not exactly the most authentic proof. A few weeks later, I went to sleep on his mezzanine. Actually, I couldn't sleep because my father in his bedroom snores like a bear, 
It was like 2 a.m. and not being able to sleep at all when I heard something downstairs. The front door opened, while I knew it was locked. At first I felt scared, but mostly because I thought someone was housebreaking. But then, when I heard something, I became even more frightened. There were footsteps. It sounded like they were barefoot. I could tell someone was walking downstairs, dragging their feet. So at some point I had to verify and I slowly walked to the stairs and stuck my head out to see if there was anyone there. And I saw a foot out of the shadow, a pale, naked foot in front of the first step. I was completely petrified. I don't know how long I saw it for, but at some point it turned back and I quickly went to bed. I heard the steps again, but I didn't hit the door this time. A few hours later, I managed to have the courage to dress and go downstairs. The door was closed. The wood stove was off, and the living room was extremely cold. And just when I went to verify if the door was locked, I heard more steps, so I ran upstairs again. The next morning I told my father about it, and he just laughed. Yeah, he comes visiting sometimes, he's probably just testing you. My father thinks I also have gifts like him, but I honestly don't believe it, at least I don't want to. I know I was completely sober when I experienced that that night. It just made me think a lot about it. Anyway, my father still lives in the house, but apparently he doesn't have much more paranormal activity than that. He says the previous owner probably got bored and moved on. Occasionally when he tells the story, I think the guy was probably really bored that time I saw him. In any case, let's not meet again, spooky ghost. Myself and a few friends went for a drive at night and parked on a country road just outside of town, right near a small bridge. We were just chatting away and hanging out in the car looking at the window, and I remember one of us pointing and saying, Shh, be quiet. Do you hear that? We all went silent and immediately heard what sounded like a crying woman. This freaked me out, and of course everyone was freaking out too in the car. I remember we were just looking everywhere outside the car to try and see something, but none of us could see anything. Then we all heard and felt what seemed like the bottom of the car being scratched. That combined with the crying. Yeah, panic ensued. True story. Also, fun note, that car was probably the fastest a car has ever gone in reverse. Saturday 8th, 2021, May. 6.45 p.m. I used to work in a large warehouse that didn't have many people in it on Saturdays and Sundays. After the daytime people leave, which happened sometime between four and five. By not many people, I mean none. Well, none in my massive section of the building, since there wasn't a whole lot to do. I hid in the back corner where the cameras couldn't see me and just dicked around until the last half hour of my shift when I actually had something to do. When it's windy, the walls will sometimes creak and groan against their support. I had been hiding in this corner for quite a number of weekends, so had gotten used to the noises. Then from the back wall that runs perpendicular to the aisle, I heard a loud woman sigh. Not a lot of women work here, but I brushed it off as being the wind acting funny on the walls. Again, even though I've literally never heard anything like that before, it was 6.45. Then an hour later, I was still there in the corner, reading a creepy ask Reddit thread, when from a few slots into the aisle directly in front of me came, oh, hello, in the exact same voice, but there was no one there. If there was, not only would I have seen them coming from quite a way away, but they would have tripped on the motion sensor light and everything would have been illuminated around me. My first thought, was that it was the wind, but it wasn't windy. Besides, I would have heard the usual creaks and groans in tandem with it. I'm also pretty sure the wall wasn't going to sound like a woman's voice, especially in two separate spots. The thing is, directly in front of me was metal racking. From where I was, I was only likely to be noticed once someone started walking down that aisle and got near the end, which was where the voice came from. She sounded surprised as though she wasn't expecting anyone to be there, and though she had the warehouse to herself. I tried to gain the courage to say something, but couldn't, 
because the thought of hearing a response weirded me out too much. I wasn't as scared as I was startled. I wanted to talk to her, but just really wasn't mentally ready for it. What if I tried to say something to her and she responded? Would I be mentally ready to handle that? Then a few minutes later, I heard her further down the aisle. Three more syllables, but no idea what she said. She was walking away from me. Well, screw you then, I rather humorously thought to myself. I couldn't quite will myself to sit back down and go back to Reddit. So I hung around for a bit and eventually left 20 minutes later. I don't think the warehouse is haunted. The various people have seen and heard various things over time. From their accounts, I'm sure there are different entities, but they wander the area and only show up in the warehouse when it's empty. Most encounters happen near the holidays, so it wasn't unusual in that regard. I continued to sit in that corner every Saturday and Sunday for the remainder of my time I worked there, and I never heard anything again, which was a little bit disappointing. When me and my sister used to share a bunk bed, we both saw dark figures looking at us through a window on the second floor of the house. And unless some guy had a ladder, and was trying to break into our house, I'm convinced it was a ghost. Whenever I'd walk or drive past a cemetery, weird stuff would happen to me later that day. It was almost as if something followed me home. And my basement had a door in it with glass panels that led to nowhere. It used to lead to an underground tunnel that connected the house across the alley, but it was filled in years ago. One time I abruptly woke up and saw a face looking at me through one of the glass panels. And sometimes I see weird lights coming through, and there are no lights. Recently I was sleeping down there due to hot weather and having no AC in my room, and I dreamt that I was in there being watched in my sleep. Every month on the 5th since I moved into this house, I always hear someone screaming, let me in, in a distorted voice outside my door. I've lived here for five years. I know these patterns. It manifests every fifth of the month. When it appears, you can smell it before you hear it, since it smells like smoke, garlic, and at first, I thought the stove was on and it was burning. But in my exhaustion, told myself it was a fire, and I bought my deer killer just in case. And when I was about to open the door, I hear banging and screaming and a man saying, let me in. And that's when I jumped to my senses and found my compact ladder and hopped out the window. This persisted for a while, and it always stays in the range of 11, 12 p.m. to 4 a.m. This happened for three months, and I thought a psycho was in my house, and I had it searched multiple times by the police. Me and my boys, the police, found nothing. So I installed a security system, and once again, when I reviewed the footage, it had been like it had never been recorded. It skipped the second it started. I wish I knew what was going on here. 